Uh, so uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. And so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, and I don't think we have any um, changes to the agenda as they are, as it, as it is. Does anyone have any information uh, different than that? No, Ms. Madam Mayor, I'd just suggest that we flip, um, that we do the meeting with the legislators before the alternate transportation issue. That is... So we do number eight before. Totally fine. Oh, I see. So flip seven and eight. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, like that. Yes, Jack. Um, I had a question about the uh, <clears throat> about the item about Girton Park. It was uh, pointed out to me uh, earlier this evening that uh, when we last took this up, you know, the motion I made was to uh, delay. Uh, consideration uh, for four weeks and then we had uh, we, we changed the uh, meeting dates for November so we're only three weeks out from that now and I gather that there was some discussion of it at uh, the how the homelessness task force meeting but uh, today I think uh, maybe yesterday but I gather that it wasn't concluded so it makes me wonder if we shouldn't uh, take this off uh, and put it to our next meeting so the people the public input that we're looking for will have had the full time uh, that that we were looking for I apologize for not mentioning it earlier but as I said I was just it was just pointed out to me today that this was a potential issue Yeah, your point is well taken. Um, my only hesitation in taking it off is that I know Paige is planning to join us um, this evening. And I think it would be at least valuable to, to hear from her, even if um, we don't do anything further with it. Is that is that okay with you there, Jack? Yeah, it's fine with me. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, anything? Well, and if, if Paige doesn't show up, then maybe we can we can table it for another day. Uh, hey, Paige uh, just asked me to. Uh, okay. Um, any other thoughts or comments on the agenda? Okay. All right. So, um, uh, objection. We will consider the agenda approved. Um, so on to business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, and so that uh, uh, if you have something you'd like to share with us, um, please uh, state your name and where you live and try to keep your comments to two minutes uh, or less or so. Um, and are there folks who would like to speak? I see. Um, uh, Elizabeth, you would like to to speak. I'm afraid my internet is a little spotty today, so my apologies. Be a miracle and please if you could bear with me. If it gets to be too bad, um, then maybe we can have Donna lead things. Okay. Um, uh, can I bring, can any, anybody hear me? Yes. Um, um, it's yes. So before miracle. you go, is yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, before you go, is there anyone else who would like to address the council? Yeah, Steve Whitaker. Okay. Uh, Deacon Kreitz here uh, with the Complete Streets Committee. I, I wouldn't mind taking a moment. Okay. Yes, and Alex uh, Chernomazov. Um, I haven't uh, seen the original agenda, but I wanted to add some considerations uh, regarding the new alternate uh, parking. Okay. Great. So, um, anyone, anyone else? I have you four so far. I should mention mm -hmm. my, my my comment is around an agenda item around the uh, active transportation fund. So, if it can, if it can wait till then, I can wait, or uh, I can speak. Oh yes, let's do that. Because if it's pertinent to that item, um, let's do it together with that yep. discussion. Oh. Is that okay? Understood. Okay. Super. All right. Uh, so, all right, uh, Elizabeth, go ahead. 
Yeah. Okay. And you can hear me now. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Oh my God. It's a miracle. Uh, I I'm having issues with my sound on zoom. Um, anyway, I'm excited to let you know that this week, um, there is an onboard survey being done, um, on the GMT routes, Montpelier hospital Hill and, uh, uh Montpelier circulator. And um, I just wanted to let you know that that's going on. If you know of any current riders, um, I am going to forward uh, information to all the members of the council. I don't think we've done that yet with a uh, tiny URL link for the SurveyMonkey um, uh, survey and also a phone number uh, where people can call in for the survey. Um, so it's exciting. People have actually been calling to do the survey. Um, we've learned a lot and we'll report on that at another meeting. So just to let you know. Oh, and, and wait a moment. The reason we're doing it is because, um, on demand micro transit and, and, and Donna will, and, and Connor will report to this later, but I'm just going to do it in case anybody uh, doesn't know about this on demand. What was formerly known as on demand micro transit is now my ride by GMT and it will be starting January 4th. And uh, we're very lucky to have um, Andy Perschlick on our uh, the uh, what is now known as the My Ride Community Advisory Group. So uh, there is a lovely group of people who are working very hard to affect this transition. So we're very lucky in Montpelier. And, and just on that topic, um, just so everyone knows, council and everyone else, GMT will be on our next meeting agenda, December second, to update us on that that service, so if anyone's interested. That's fabulous. Um, okay, um, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, I want to uh, just point out that your uh, public restrooms, the library is now closed again. I suspect that the executive order is going to necessitate uh, rabble rouser being closed. City Hall is closed that your public bathrooms, uh, it, collectively, you're either cruel or uh, oblivious or both. But it, the fact that people cannot find a place to use a bathroom is a real problem, and you need to address it. You need to address it at every meeting until you solve it. Secondly, I raised this at the Homelessness Task Force meeting this morning, that the charge that was given to that committee 15, 16 months ago, they have failed to do any of what they were charged to do. Their own sole accomplishment is a couple of porta johns with no hand washing facilities. So you really, you know, it was, uh, I res refrained from saying this last time that to delegate them to address and solve the dilemma of what role the pocket part should have, um, or what should multiple of them, et cetera, is somewhat farcical. Uh, when it was appointed, we recommended that it not be service providers, but service providers be interviewed by the task force so that vested interests and those invested in status quo would not be controlling the meetings. Now you have Good Samaritan, Another Way, Center for Independent Living, the police department maintaining status quo and not fulfilling their mission. I, my recommendation is dissolve it and face it, face the music as the city obligation to deal with that issue because it's not getting done a year and a half later and it's it's a travesty of bad governance. Uh, additionally, the web, well, that's enough for now. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and um, just to follow up on that, um, you know, uh, we had made a list of publicly available restrooms. Um, that was pre the most recent uh, closures due to COVID. And I wonder if we could um, update that list. Um, would that, um, I'm seeing Cameron shaking her head there. Is that something that seems doable? Yes, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, thank you so much. It's still a useless effort. You've got an emergency problem going on with a COVID pandemic and people cannot wash their hands anywhere. There's no bathroom at Shaw's. There's no bathroom. Anyway, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Um, 
Uh, Alec. Oh, yes, go ahead, Bill. You had two other people waiting for general business. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, Dayton is uh, going to hold off on his comment. Um, so, Alex, I think you are up. Okay, hello. Um, so, my, uh, no, uh, I'm not 100% uh, familiar with the overall format. So I, uh, uh, my, uh, the general concern I have is uh, the new alternate parking uh, that uh, requires people to move their vehicle every day uh, side to side. And like f uh, the concern is uh, multifaceted, uh, kind of uh, somewhat uh, water under the bridge is uh, how it was communicated. I only learned it when it was already enacted. And I know like, uh, in the retrospect, I found a single post on the front porch forum and uh, uh, like, I'm not, like I left social media a few, some years ago, it was just too much, uh, try, I was trying to retain my sanity. And uh, the price is not being able to like, and, uh, learn about things like this. I would have joined the early discussions, but again, at this point, it's water under the bridge, but kind of hopefully something could be done better going forward. But realistically, uh, uh, speaking of going forward, uh, the concerns, uh, specific concern I have are multifaceted. One is uh, the, the overall amount of carbon uh, output that uh, moving, especially since the rule uh, says that uh, it will, that vehicles must be moved in the uh, evening after five o'clock. So it's, a, it's in the winter, we're talking about colder time, it, everything will take longer. So like I actually made a little experiment. I took an, a half an hour, I drove all around town uh, using my electrically car charged car <laughs> and counted cars and parked on the streets. I uh, made some estimates like how long it takes to move the car, compare, uh, compared uh, like average car, car efficiency. So long story short, uh, at the most uh, optimistic estimate, it would com uh, generate 11,000 uh, pounds of carbon uh, compared to the same, uh, compared to uh, uh, city vehicles even uh, waiting. Like I remember, I know the argument is that uh, the city vehicles that are doing plowing have to wait for the cars to get towed at night. And like I even took into consideration uh, like some excessive number of uh, towings that would be done. So uh, long story short, at, at we, uh, the, like from carbon point of view, like I, I'm happy to share this, uh, calculate my calculations, and uh, also it would cost all, uh, every single person who has to move their car one day of their life through the winter, like over a winter, to move their cars. Uh, so uh, I realize I understand exactly the problem that we are trying to solve, and I'm not saying that we should not solve it. But I am uh, not sure if this is the best way of solving. So from what, from a little bit of googling I did, uh, I see that it was inspired by Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, looks like they are already rolling this program back. Like uh, so, just to, uh, so that's a, 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 a brief uh, feedback I have. Happy to elaborate a little more and share the spreadsheet. Alex, I appreciate your um, uh, calculations uh, that that you took the time to make some calculations about this and looking at it from a carbon perspective. Um, I would love to see them, uh, and I'd love to chat with you about about those calculations. Um, so if you get the, the chance to send them along, I would be very interested. Um, so uh, fodder for further discussion. Sound all right? I'm going okay. to, um, like, I am, uh, pay, oh, chat is disabled. I was going to paste the link to the Google spreadsheet into the chat, but it's off. Yeah. Oh, go ahead and, and just email it to me. Will and do. We'll, we'll follow up. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, was there anyone else? And Cameron, are you seeing any uh, hands of anyone? Not right now. Okay. 
Could I, uh, something I meant to add, just a quick thing. Uh, I was, uh, as a possible solution going forward, uh, I wonder if uh, like I, to, to solve the problem that uh, I'm, I'm assuming mainly we're talking about uh, the, the nightly budgets uh, for, for due to overtime. So maybe it could be that people move cars side to side only when uh, necessary. So we kind of follow the model of the of, of how it used to be. So we, we announce a, park, a parking ban and at this point people begin moving cars uh, uh, side to side. And, uh, so this way it could be done during the day and we avoid uh, overtime at night. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, all right. Uh, so moving on, so we um, uh, just to, to be clear, so this uh, this next item, an uh, appointment to the Montpelier or as a um, to have a Montpelier member to the Capstone uh, board is really uh, more of a recommendation um, from this group. Um, and I see that there are some folks here uh, who are uh, who have uh, applied for that. And would love to give uh, folks an opportunity to introduce themselves and um, discuss their their interest in helping to to serve uh, uh, Capstone in this way. And um, yes, yeah, so we'll go we'll go from there. So I I see that uh, Abby White and Gabriel Lajunes are both here. Am I um, missing anyone else who applied? Uh, Jack, yeah. yeah. Mayor, before we hear from the candidates, I see that Sue Minter, the executive director of Capstone, is here, and I uh, would like to give her an opportunity to say something if she wants to. I think that's a great idea. Uh, Sue, would you like to say anything about this? Thanks. I don't want to take a lot of your time, but I really appreciate your taking time to focus on kind of our mission is to really um, we have a board that is what we call a tripartite board. So one third of our members to our board are the clients we serve. Um, the participants is the word we use. One third comes from the private sector and one third comes from the public sector. And we also, as you may know, serve uh, Orange County, Lamoille County and Washington County. We have four um, different uh, members of the public sector and right now uh, we have a member representing the city of Barrie. Uh, we have a member of the state legislature from Orange, Representative Jay Hooper. We have a, a member from Lamoille County who is appointed by Representative David Iacovoni. And I was hoping and uh, reached out to the mayor to see if we could engage the city in uh, sort of being represented and being a part of our work and our mission through this. So. You know, what we have done is, is worked in tandem and reached out to some folks. Um, I'm happy to see whoever applies. And I do want to say that our board has met with Abby because she expressed an interest um, already before even there was an opening on our board. So uh, we have met with her on a couple of occasions and she has visited our board, but we obviously will welcome other applicants, um, but we'll look to you for a recommended applicant um, to serve on our board to uh, represent you and your interests and also to be a liaison to you so that you learn more about what we are trying to do on behalf of the vulnerable uh, citizens and residents of Montpelier. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, all right, well, uh, so we can uh, go in either order here. Um, so uh, why don't we why don't we start with uh, Gabriel? Uh, would you uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in serving on the Capstone Board? Yeah, great. Thanks for uh, having me here tonight, and uh, appreciate. I mean, Abby sounds like she's very interested. I'm sure she's a a great candidate. I uh, just love the work that's being done by Capstone, uh, and so grateful for your leadership there. Uh, I've come to know Capstone really through service at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We did a, a grant last year uh, for several of the community action agencies for a clothing drive, and, um, and, and Sue's team received a lot of that and was able to distribute that over the last year. I'm really grateful for that. Just so much of the work they do. Um, you know, over the last few years, up until 2018, I was in the board at the Veterans Place 
And so that homelessness problem that we have, uh, you know, working through that, just again, great partnerships that we've seen there. It's a great cause. And when I saw the post looking for somebody to represent Montpelier, I thought, well, I'd love to join that effort and, uh, and help. Um, I'm a financial advisor. I work with Edward Jones, had a practice here until just recently moved down to Barrie, um, have a legal background. And anyway, I'd, I'd love to help if there's a need. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Abby, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Abby White. Good to be with you here. Uh, I know many of you. I'm, I'm a Montpelier resident. Obviously, I have two uh, children in the Montpelier school systems, one that's in the middle school, one that's in the elementary school. And um, for my day job, when I'm not being a mother, I work for the Vermont Land Trust, and I'm the vice president for strategic communications there. So I became familiar with Capstone in previous work um, when I was working on weatherization and really trying to advance both access and resources for weatherization throughout the state and had a great opportunity to work with Sue and her team, Paul Zabriskie over there and just became deeply familiar with the work that they're doing on so many different fronts to combat poverty in our region. So became aware, interested, and um, just really an admirer of the organization and, and of Sue and her leadership. You know, later, it, it, I would say over the last year, I thought a lot uh, more about Capstone as we saw what was happening in our community and the ravages of the pandemic and the economic fallout that that we continue to, to see and the gross disparity that that's um, not just revealed, but deepened. And I truly believe that poverty is just one of the, if not the most important issue that we need to address. It's at the root of, of so many other causes in society. Um, whether that's climate related, whether it's, um, you know, education, healthcare. And I see Capstone as an organization that's really leading on that in our region. And like many of you, uh, this year has, has been <laughs> just one for the record books and one I think that's forced all of us to just think more deeply about what, are, what am I doing? And what can I be doing more? How can I deepen my commitment? And so I reached out to Sue and, and expressed my desire to, to get more involved just because I see the need and I, I see the opportunity for, for more of us to get involved and be active participants in this democracy because if, if we don't, then who will? So that summarizes my interest and um, thank you again for the opportunity and just look forward to Next steps. Great, thank you. Uh, any counselors have questions? Donna, go ahead. I'd just like to comment that Abby was one who put some really clear, relatable words in your narrative, in your application. I mean, the seven people applied all have amazing resumes, have made contributions to our community, but I really felt that your statement of why you wanted to serve on this committee really laid out the understanding of its purpose. I was very impressed. And so I hope one, I congratulate you on that wording, wherever it takes you. But on also to Sue, we have seven people here. So I hope you take advantage of somehow finding a place for these people to help you because they're all very, uh, very qualified. Thank you. I yes. want to just chime in to say there is room for help in many ways. So I am thrilled to hear that there are seven applicants. And Gabriel, your 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 investment in us through this warm clothing drive has been incredible. Your financial background, I know that if there are seven people that want to be a part of Capstone, there's room for you. There probably is only room for one member of the formal board, but we have many committees and many activities, and I would love the chance to engage all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? 
from the council. Okay, um, so uh, Jack, go ahead. Pursuant to 1 VSA section 313A3, I move that we go into executive session for the purpose of considering an appointment of a public official. Second. Second. <laughs> uh, excellent, we got a couple seconds. Um, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, the counselors will uh, be leaving this call, but the call will stay open. And um, all right, we will. I'd like to make the motion that we ask the capstone to consider appointing Amy White to their board of directors and Gabriel Lanzies as an alternate. Second. And you meant you meant Abby, right? Abby, yes. And okay. Uh, all right. Sorry, was there a second? Jack. Okay, there was a second. Um, further discussion. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. All right. Well, we want to thank both of you for uh, your interest and your time. Um, and certainly um, keep us posted as to um, you know what's going on with Capstone and how we can uh, be involved. The, the work of Capstone is just so important, especially now. Uh, we're so grateful for, for everything um, Capstone does. So uh, please pass along our, our gratitude uh, to, to everyone there. Uh, all right, thank you. Um, and we, we also want to encourage all of the other uh, applicants uh, to uh, consider getting involved and and uh, as as Sue said there are lots of ways that people can can be involved um, with capstone so thank you again thank you all so much Thanks, and we'll be sure to reach out to every applicant thank you okay. super thank you okay uh, so just to um, revisit uh, the uh, Girton Pocket Park um, item. Is there anyone here for the Girton Pocket Park? Uh, Steve Wick, I'm gonna, if you take it up, I'm going to speak to it. Would you be opposed to us tabling it? Not at all. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll we'll just um, push that off to another um, meeting. Um, all right. So. Uh, meeting with our uh, our delegation. So we are so grateful that you are here. Uh, thank you for taking the time to meet with us as we uh, chat with you about our uh, what our priorities would be for this session. And uh, we do want to make this a discussion and uh, see what your impressions are uh, for this, this coming, uh, coming session. So we have had a uh, committee of the council come up with priorities, and I'm going to turn things over to um, any member of that committee to kick us off here. I, I don't mind kicking it off. Um, I, I think maybe Bill would be best to go through the whole agenda there since there's a lot of staff recommendations um, to flesh out. But I, I would just say um, very grateful for the delegation to come to a meeting like this. Um, you know, I think it's more important than ever uh, during the pandemic that close tie between municipal government and the state government. And uh, I, I think the genesis of this was, you know, we just realized we don't know what we don't know uh, is happening uh, under the dome there. Um, and it, it's, it's really great to be able to rely on all of you to let us know of any opportunities we should come up for. Uh, just an example, um, when we heard one of the colleagues in the Senate there might be looking at cutting pilot funds, you know, Bill sent an email to all three of our senators, who I think every one of them got back within like an hour to bill, just to set the record straight that this wasn't happening. And something like that is so important, I think. Um, so as we go into the next um, biennium, you know, I'm sure COVID is going to continue dominating. And, um, you know, looking at the, the gap in our budget and the difficult decisions uh, we're going to have to be making in the next few weeks, 
um, any any opportunities to draw down state funds to sort of fill those gaps and uh, meet the services at a time when people need them most um, are going to be so appreciated. So a lot of this legislative agenda is duplicative of last year. I think there are some new things in it, though. Um, but yeah, just wanted to, uh, on behalf of the committee, thank you so much for spending the time coming in here tonight. I'll just follow up with that, just more of a process. Uh, as, as you recall, we met with you all this in the spring, I guess, or near the end of the session, and decided that that timing wasn't great. And we, ha we had our laundry list. Uh, and, I, and what we had agreed at that time with you was we would work up uh, some ideas, run them past the council, and then have a conversation with you folks about, about our the, the council's ideas, what what were top on your list, what was, you know, if there were things on there that just were never going to happen to let us know now, and also if there were things we should have on. And then after meeting with you, finalize our actual formal agenda so that it's really done collaboratively with you. So uh, the council appointed a committee of uh, Lauren, Connor, and Dan, uh, with my, me as the staff help. And uh, the, our group drafted the initial list the city council as a whole looked at it, made a couple of changes. And then the staff uh, list at the end wasn't really run through the city council. Those were just things that the staff was tracking, those that chose to offer staff suggestions, um, just because some of them are more technical in nature. Um, so I don't have, I wasn't planning to read through the whole list unless people want me to. I assume you all have it. And if there's anything specific people want to ask about or comment on, I think we're interested in hearing and having a dialogue. Okay. I would I would mention one or two things. If that's okay. I mean Yes, no, go ahead, Senator Cleaner. Yeah. I think your list is good. I don't have any problems with it obviously all most of it involves money and that's the problem in general um there are some of us who are willing to find ways to raise revenue and i'm willing one of those people i think we need to raise revenue to meet our needs but i think any of these things are going to be difficult given the financial situation and we just have to be aware of that we're not sure of course whether or not there's going to be federal money I and mean, we have to assume there's going to be some federal money because i mean as bad as things are in washington you have to presume that they're going to come up with something I mean, it's, I mean, I guess there's part of me that wouldn't be surprised if they did not, but it, it's just, I can't accept the fact that they would actually do nothing. So I, I'm hoping for the best. Um, I wanted to mention two things though, that are sort of on your list, just to keep in mind. We did have, in terms of the, um, I forget how it's phrased on your list, but giving local municipalities more power, more decision-making, I forget how we, you, how you refer to it, but we did have a bill last year I think it was S-106, which basically was a convoluted way of trying to allow certain communities to take more control over their local decision making. It passed the Senate um, and it's, it got stuck in the House Government Operations Committee. I'm not sure, but I presume we're going to take something like that up again. I mean, it's almost become something in, in the Senate Government Operations Committee. It's almost become something of like a, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but it's kind of like a joke. You know, we, we joke about the fact that, you know, we're making decisions for towns all the time. We're never like allowing towns to have input into their own decision making. So I think we will revisit that. Um, the other thing I just want to put on the table, because you've heard from some folks from Montpelier, is the non-citizen voting um, charter change and whether or not the city is interested in move, trying to move forward with that again. As you remember, it passed this, the House it got stuck in the Senate. Um, there would be some, there are some changes going to happen in the Senate, which might make it easier to move that through the Senate. I can't guarantee it, but I just want to make sure that if we, we've, Mary and Andy and I have talked about it a little bit. Um, usually those things have to, they don't have to start in the House, but they traditionally start in the House. But we want to make sure that if we're going to do that, that you folks want to see it happen. We don't want to, want to try to make it happen again. So I just put that on the table as well. So we, we will be doing more around trying to give municipalities some power. Not going to guarantee it's going to happen, but we're going to try. And then we'll take up the voter thing again if folks want us to. And then the, the other thing is just we'll, we'll scratch under every cushion to try to find money that we can send back to local communities. I mean, as you know, you can imagine, we, we all go through downtown Montpelier. And we just see it's, 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 really, it's really quiet, let's put it that way. I mean, it's really sad. 
and they've just told the state employees that they should be ready to work at home into March at least is what they said. And I can't imagine what it must be like for someone who owns a restaurant in Montpelier at this point or a cafe or, or any kind of business really, but it's just really frightening to me that these folks are going to have to like try to survive a handful of more months without any more support. So we'll do everything we can to get them support that they, as much as that we could muster, make them survive and hopefully come out the other end of this thing still in business. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Senator Comer. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're all going to be focused on physical and economic survival. And I think um, once a vaccine becomes available, we're going to have to be doing some coordinating with the, the cities and towns to get as much of that vaccine out there as quickly as we can. We've been, again, trying to use every cent of federal money to target those businesses the good news is any business downtown and that's a lot of them that use NACIS code 72 um, which was new to me I keep thinking of NCIS but it is a tax code it is on your tax form and it basically we were trying to target the hospitality industry but that covers bars restaurants um, anyone that pays basically uh, rooms and meals tax. And with the remaining 75 million that joint fiscal um, approved on Saturday, uh, those businesses will be getting 100% of their unmet need. Now, unmet need is um, not the best form. They're basically taking last year's revenue, subtracting this year's revenue and any grants you've gotten and what remains is your, your need. It doesn't help a lot of restaurants and things that were only in business for two months last year because they didn't have much revenue. So um, we're working through that. Um, the rest of the businesses retail we think we'll be get we'll be getting right now they've gotten a third of their unmet need we believe we're going to be able to do 50 percent so there is some financial hope out there again we really need more federal funds um we're going through every cent there will be some more money we think going unspent and joint fiscal is meeting again Friday and we'll probably meet one or two more times before this is done but we know that we're going to need some more money right now for advanced testing and uh, perhaps some surge hospitals depending on how the virus tracks um, and I think that's it. Um, we are all looking for money. Uh, in June, I was looking at a $150 million shortfall in the Ed Fund and about $200 million in the General Fund. The Ed Fund, last time I looked, is down to only about $60 million, and there's a $30 million reserve that has to be filled in there. But we also know that we deficit spent in the Ed Fund this year, not to do a, a tax increase other than the 4% that the towns voted. So um, we're going to, we've got some ways to deal with that inter loan borrowing and a few other things, but that will, we're hoping everybody go out and buy something. Um, because the sales tax, uh, apparently a lot of folks spent um, their federal benefit um, buying things, uh, large items online, and thanks to the Wayfair decision, uh, that brought the, the deficit in the Ed Fund down um, from 150 to a mere $60 million. So um, we're we're going to be working through that. We know the schools are going to have have extra costs. We know the cities have extra costs. Um, everybody 
write somebody else's congressman because our Congress, our delegation is all good. Um, but we really do need some more federal money in here. It's um, anything that's left on December 30th will now by law go into the unemployment fund to replenish that because we don't want to have to increase unemployment taxes, um, which would probably fall on those who have been hit the most that had to lay off the most people. So we're trying and I think working together um, and I am, I voted to increase income taxes twice before to protect the safety net. We're going to be looking at if there are ways to work with the tax code um, to find out how we can find the revenue, which we're probably going to need before we get out of this. So that's where we are. And can I say, it was really nice to be here to see the capstone um, discussion because that's how I started. So Abby White might want to be careful. Uh, I started out as the um, the city council representative to what then was the Central Vermont Community Action Council. And that service um, played a big part in getting me appointed to the city council. So it was good, full circle. Oh, that's very cool. Well, so thank you. Anyone else want to, any of the other delegation want to share? I Go ahead. Uh, Senator I, had a, I didn't know if you wanted, I had a couple of questions, at least on one thing, you know, as far as my relationship to the city, I'm, I'm really interested in the, my ride by GMT, we're now calling it mm -hmm. and participating on that. And I really want to see that be successful. So we'll be watching that both just because I'm interested in and also in my position, if I'm still on transportation committee. Well, one of the things listed on here was support legislation allowing removal of red line deed restrictions, which I'm assuming Montpelier doesn't have any, but it, uh, assuming you're just kind of supporting municipalities in general, if we had, for those municipalities that have those, they should just be able to take them out and take them off and not have to go through legislative charter approval. That's what you're advocating there. Um, so actually we were, we were approached by a resident who had looked into this and there are deeds, not only in Montpelier, but all around the state that have, have that language, still have red line language in them. In the deed. The, the, the courts have ruled that they're invalid. So they're not enforceable, but this particular individual and others wanted them taken out of their deed. They didn't want, and, and we're kind of told that you just can't do that. You know, this, that there's a whole chain of deed title and it was the initial deed and it's it's not allowed to be you know basically thou shalt never mess with you know the deed and certainly mm -hmm. and so this person wanted the city to to sort of have asked for the authority to take or, or to grant authority to to change deed language and they're like i don't think we can do this this is something probably that has to come from the legislature and probably has to be done statewide so so yes there is red line language in deeds it's not enforceable thankfully Okay. But it still it. exists, and, and someone, you know, I don't blame. I wouldn't want a deed that says you can't sell it to X, Y, or Z person. Right. So, oh, yeah, I get it now. I thought it was maybe the restrictions from the municipalities about the deeds. But yeah, maybe yeah. Anthony, if he's still on government ops, we could figure out a way to, to to address that. And from the real estate days, probably has some thoughts on that, maybe. But one other thing, uh, and I can talk to Bill offline maybe about is the district heating system. I have interest in that. I want to see it be successful and expanded. And I know there was some concerns about the contract with the state. So if we want to open that up, maybe sleeping dogs are best to lay light, <laughs> left to lay light. But if not, uh, I'm willing mm -hmm. to, to take that on. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about that. Um... We did actually uh, have a successful year this year where we, you know, we brought in more money than we spent. That was good. Uh, trying to trying to That's whittle good. down you know, some, some of our, our losses. I think the toughest part with expansion right now, honestly, is the price of oil. Okay. Uh, it's just a tough, you know, to ask someone to to consider, you know, redoing their whole building or, or even just their their connection uh, plus 
you know, taking on, it's, it's a, it's a big financial ask right mm -hmm. now, um, which is of course the exact opposite of the direction we expected to be yeah. when, when, uh, this system was being put in, we were seeing nothing but straight up. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's hanging in there, but I think, I do think some of our costs with the state, uh, could be revisited. That would be great. And uh, particularly some of the capacity issues that interpretations of capacity that the state has raised, which I, uh, you know, I see, you know, Mary here, we, we sweat a lot of blood over this and, um, you know, it was not at all the way, um, we, the interpretation now is not what we agreed to. So, um, yeah, well, that's an issue. I think you have a good team here. If you want to bring it up again, you know, okay. between the house and yeah. the Senate, we should be able to to do something if we if we need to. Okay, that's great to know. Well, it's, maybe we should set up something separately on that. And, I, and one other thing, it's not on your list, but last time we did talk, I think I was supposed to reach out to Donna at some point, but I never did, was about the dispatching. And so I don't know if Donna still is the point person on that, but I, I will do that if there's still an interest in talking about dispatch. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Dan Richardson is the appointed member from the council and I'm actually an at-large elected member of the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority Board. But I think both of us would really appreciate having a, a conversation with you. Okay, great, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, Mayor, um, John Odom has his hand raised. Okay, um, John, go ahead. Oh, just uh, uh, just a note to make sure that uh, to include me in conversations about uh, any kind of retroactive continuity of deeds. Um, uh, just, you know, my impulse is I think that's a very dangerous slippery slope and it is the kind of thing I get invited to the legislature to talk about. So I just wanted to make sure we were all on the same side. About that. Yeah. <laughs> just bring me into that. Oh, but as long as I've got the floor, I just want to mention to Senator Polina, um, I'm sure that the city will, um, you know, will feel the same way. But in terms of non-citizen voting, my office has been very assertive in pushing it. Um, and um, did I say irregardless? Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, and we'll continue to, to do so. It's, it's pretty near and dear to my heart. So. Okay. Um, Mary, go ahead, and then Connor. Yeah. So, I I won't repeat what other folks have said about our concerns about revenue and expenses, other than to say I worry about it every day. Um, so yes, that's on on my list too. Um, in terms of kind of the particular portfolio I carry, I'm very interested in um, the, the justice related issues and so mm -hmm. the issues you all raised regarding community services, the police social worker, um, the effects of legislation on policing, etc got it and am paying attention to it. I'm particularly interested in figuring out how we can help push um, support into to the communities that are obviously kind of our first um, point of, of where we ought to be offering services and helping prevent folks from going deeper into the system and and so got that in my brain and, and hope you'll in, keep me in your conversations and let me know what you're seeing um, in terms of actions that you would like um, us to be paying attention to. Uh, it would be helpful to know uh, some about your revenue, the, the municipal, the city's struggles with okay. revenue in terms of our making arguments uh, within our bo respective bodies about why we need to be supporting you. Um, I find that we're particularly in tune with issues 
tax issues around the education fund, but tend to be somewhat less sympathetic to the burden of, um, of property tax as it relates to municipal issues. Um, so just keep us in the conversation on that. Um, one of the things that's been on my list is just how y'all feel about the train or the railroad. Um, I, I look at the pile of trash that's kind of next to Ann's house um, and am very disappointed that we have seen um, the change that we've seen in the railroad. So we had talked about having a conversation and never did, but it's on my list. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, yep. I just want to offer several comments about the, the topics that Mary um, raised, and hopefully I'll hit them all. Uh, so going back, you know, reverse order, the railroad, um, we had met uh, with the railroad, with VTrans. Uh, Senator Perchlick was actually pretty helpful with that. And um, I think when we were talking before, we were talking about, you know, they had engineering study and trying to trying to figure this out. And the next thing we knew, the tracks were being put in. Right. And um, really, nobody knew that was coming. And I, I'm not really sure how that all happened. And, and uh, so, you know, any any I suppose review that you all can do to, to to learn more about that would be great. But the fact is, it's you know they're done. Um, it would be nice to see them clean up along the tracks. Um, and in fact really wanted to go for a big ass to get that rail yeah, car that's been there for 30 or 40 years out but uh yeah but i definitely uh that's been one thing with regard to um so i'm gonna jump around to the the, the sort of needy population i think what we're seeing and, and here i'm speaking a little bit statewide not just popular but you know, there's been budget cutbacks, budget cutbacks, you know, federal, state for years. And as the human services mm -hmm. costs have, have diminished, they've fallen more and more and more and more onto, onto city government to the point where, you know, you heard Steve Whitaker talk earlier about, you know, being disappointed in what our homeless task force did. And, and, and you know, he's not totally wrong. I mean, not about the individuals necessarily, but, you know, we don't have the know-how. We don't have the expertise. We have the organizational infrastructure to deal with these things yet it's sort of falling on us to, to figure these things out because the state doesn't seem to have the, the, the financial wherewithal or the capacity to, to deal with it so I think we're just asking for you know and, and, and I know that the money is a, is a bad situation so I get that but somehow um, we're having growing needs and um, the, the sort of partnership of who does what it seems to be eroding and it's a real concern for, I think, any city or town that has a, cent a community center. You know, the rural community, I don't think it's as much of an issue, but the places that have, you know, the downtowns are, are definitely feeling it. Um, toward that end, there's one very specific thing on our list, which also you heard mentioned, and that is a, a public bathroom. Uh, and it, it seems pretty, you know, small, but it actually is an urgent need. And we have spent a lot of time talking about it. COVID has certainly, you know, the state has closed its public bathrooms, the city, everyone has. Um, but visitors who come to the city are coming to use our businesses, they're coming to visit the state, they're coming to use all sorts of things. And it certainly would be a, a nice thing if perhaps we could partnership, and, you know, and I think on the scale of money, this is not a giant multi-million dollar endeavor. Uh, to find some common place or two in downtown Montpelier where we could actually construct real bathrooms mm -hmm. uh, for for all people to use uh, and and that it seems to be a concrete bad pun uh, thing that we could do that could show results that would not be a big and meet a real need and and not uh, and not be a big ticket item lastly you talked about municipal revenues and again i think it's a little bit of a different story depending on on the, the community you're in so I'll speak just for Montpelier because uh, it isn't just the property tax. Um, I mean, obviously we are collecting our property taxes. We are, we're, we've seen a little bit of delinquency, but really hasn't been too bad uh, compared to normal. It's a little bit slower, but we are concerned that, you know, the longer this goes on, um, 
about people's ability to keep paying bills. Uh, you know, as, as people are out of work, as their businesses suffer, as you know, whatever happens, and certainly, uh, you know, the municipal tax rate here in Montpelier is, is high. So that's, that's just a fresh pressure as it always is. But for us, um, you know, Senator Polina mentioned, you know, the, the sort of quietness of downtown Montpelier that has uh, translated for us to just massive loss in parking revenue. Um, we also rely on rooms, meals and alcohol tax and that has dropped drastically. Uh, we rely on fees for uh, senior center services, rec programs, all those kind of programs of people gathering and doing all these things. Those have gone off the table. Um, so, so we have a very substantial revenue loss that isn't really just property tax. Um, it's all the other things that make up. And so to cover that, those losses, uh, we have to raise our property tax by something like 20 cents just to be whole. And, uh, you know, I see two former mayors on here. You know how, how viable that is in, in a city yeah. budget conversation. That's just not that's not on the table and nor should it be, I think right now. So, so that's what we're up against. And then we are really concerned about pilot. Um, thank you all for making sure that we were held whole this past year and, and thank you for the support on that. And we'd like to believe that's gonna happen again next year, but we all know that pilot is funded by local options taxes throughout the state, which means sales tax, rooms, meals and alcohol taxes, et cetera. In, in those communities that have local options taxes. So if they are all experiencing the same kind of economic activity downturn that we're seeing, it stands to reason that the fund, the pilot fund will not have the same kind of resources in it that it's had in years past. Um, and, and so we, in terms of next, the budget we're preparing now are anticipating a shortfall in our pilot revenue based on, on that supposition. You know, we, we haven't seen hard numbers. So, so there are a list of, of revenues. Now, as I said, that particular pie isn't the same for everybody. I think if you're a small rural town, dependent solely, really essentially only on property tax, maybe you're doing okay. You know, you're, you're hanging in there. Um, for those communities that have a, have a bigger diversity of revenue stream, particularly based on activity, yeah, I, I think we're all really hurting. So, you know, we're looking at, I mean, our, actually our team is meeting tomorrow to talk about a $1.7 million budget gap, uh, which for us is what, 15% or something, 13% that, that we've got to present to the city council in a couple of weeks. So it's real and it's going to have a big impact on services and projects and, and all those other things, just as it is at the state. I get it. I, I mean, I'm not, yeah. and one of the things mm -hmm. I personally was, was, hoping that we could hear was exactly what you know about the states. I've, I've gone on way too long, but I hope I answered the question. Yeah, that's okay. Bill, would you just send, can you pop what the revenue losses by fund are just, I don't know, on a spreadsheet or just yeah. a little way for me to see what they are. It'll help me with my conversation. Do you memorize all that? No. No, yeah, not yet. You're slipping. <laughs> yeah. um, no, we'll send it. We have we have it all prepared, obviously, okay. um, for our own budget work and yeah. you know for the council. Like, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll get to it. In in terms of of where the state is, um, you're you're right to be thinking about what the funds are in pilot. Um, so that's something to watch. I I'm actually somewhat relieved that it is not as awful as we thought it was going to be for FY22. Yeah. Um, and sadly, in some ways, the longer some of this goes on, it creates different revenue op options. So for example, as long as we're in a state of emergency, we get an increase in what the percentage of Medicaid funds are that the state receives that amounts to, oh, God, it's been a while since I've thought about it, but I think it's on the order of six to eight million dollars per quarter. And, you know, so it turns into some real, <coughs> money. So there's just some weirdness like that. And obviously, as Ann mentioned, we're, we're hoping for 
federal relief. Um, I, I personally have been very disappointed that we have not focused that more on the services that both state and government, uh, state and local government provide. And instead it has um, gone out the door to people who are desperately in need. But, um, you know, you guys are our first line of, of service and, and, and defense and we need to be thinking about you. you we'll, we'll do the next, we, or we are monthly getting revenue updates and, and so that's all on the joint fiscal site if you want to kind of follow it there, but we'll see the next formal uh, forecast in January, January when we'll build the budget from there. And hopefully we'll know something from the feds, but I, <laughs> I've said that every month that hopefully we'll know something from the feds and it hasn't yeah. happened yet. It's really disappointing. So I have some further comments about the railroad, but I um, interrupted Connor earlier. So Connor, um, do you want to still have the, do you still have a comment? Oh, sure. I just had a quick process question. And uh, on the legislative subcommittee, we suspected, but we didn't know for sure on a charter change um, the non-U.S. citizen voting in particular. Uh, we suspect we would need to put that to another vote again, um, but we didn't know that. for sure and probably should have asked John Odom. We, I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think you need to vote on it again. Yeah. Um, I think you just need to say that you want us to work on it again. It's well, I think, yeah, it needs to be resubmitted. Everything right, died. Right, yeah. so it needs but, to be resubmitted. But that's something you, you you just need to say, will you please do it? And we'll put in a bill request. And if, there's emails out there asking that right now. Yeah. Right. If it had been several years since the city vote, it might be wise just in terms of making the argument to the legislature that it was still pertinent. But I think it's fresh enough that we're okay. I feel comfortable resubmitting. Mm -hmm. That's great to hear. Thanks so much. Yeah. So, sort of to that point about the non-citizen voting um, and some of the other items that we have discussed tonight, how focused on COVID-related uh, bills do you think the legislature is going to be this year in terms of like, is anything else going to pass or will it be all COVID all the time? Good question. We actually passed things last year. We were limited, at least in the Senate, to at first to doing COVID. But this year, we're getting better at COVID. I mean, I, I think we know what needs to be done. Uh, I can say this is the first time I haven't been proud to represent Washington County when we are the highest COVID hotspot in the state. And we need to get that under control because until that's under control, um, all the money that may be available is going to be being held in case we need to open surge or, um, you know, do more massive testing. But I think, I know both bodies are still trying to figure out how we might be able to meet in person. I'm sure you found out there are limits to Zoom meetings, um, to the, the level of discussion, and there's definitely a level to not meeting at the water cooler in the hall, um, to finding out what's going on on the other side of the building. So, um, you know, it's probably at this point, as soon as we get a vaccine and get it out there, um, we'd all like to be back in person and back doing other things, other bills. There's going to be some cleanup, but I think this year we figured out how to do Zoom, and so it will be easier to do other things um, within that limitation. So I, I, think, I think things will get done, probably not as much as other years, but probably more than last year. 
Yeah, I, yeah, I would agree. agree. I think it's going to be, it's, it's not going to be just COVID. There'll be other yeah. opportunities to pass legislation. Okay, that's encouraging. And just to get back to um, Mary's question about the railroad, uh, I uh, have asked repeatedly for <laughs> the debris that's next to my house uh, to be removed and not received replies. Um, I know Bill has also um, inquired about that. And uh, I continue to feel like they're not communicating sufficiently in terms of uh, warning for uh, spraying pesticides. And I am curious as to um, where things landed. I know we had had some conversation previously about having some uh, exclusion zones or some uh, areas that would be exempted from pesticide spraying. And I, I, I'm not sure that I know where that landed. Um, Is it pesticides or herbicides? Herbicide. Well, so I, I think in this point. situation, um, an herbicide, like the pesticide is the umbrella term. Um, and so okay. I know it seems like pesticide would just be for animals, but it's not. Um, okay. Yeah, and I think Mary put in a bill. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm yeah. willing to do that on the Senate side this time around. And um, have you guys been talking to the railroad or to VTrans, AOT, about the debris and other stuff? Well, so to be fair, I think the people I, I was emailing um, were in uh, VTrans. Okay. Well, and, and we haven't had much contact with either of them in the last year, year and a half. You know, we've all had other stuff going on. Uh, and then we had this railroad issue that we kind of flipped right. out a yeah. rail issue on Mary Street. But um, so most of our communication with VTrans and the rail has been about that specific project. Um, so these other issues, I think, from at least from my perspective, have not had a lot of attention recently. But well, I'll, still, they're still live walls. I agree that I was disappointed in the way I, the whole thing worked out, even from before that we had the last the meeting, whatever that was, over a year ago. So I'll reach out and we can have make sure we have a meeting where we can list our grievances. That would be great. And Andrew, would you make sure that, and Bill, would you make sure that I'm included on that? I've had very specific conversations with the Secretary of, a of VTrans about this and was assured that what happened would not happen. I mean, the same experience that you related, Bill. And um, I have some thoughts about how the level of control that we can exercise given that the state of <coughs> the property and does not have to enter into a lease with the railroad unless it chooses to. And I think the lease is probably coming up just to be really, to be militant about it. For whatever it's worth, they had piled uh, quite a bit of uh, organic debris, trees that they'd cut down and so on, uh, on city property, and uh, they they did eventually remove that. So we know they can do it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay, any, any other thoughts, comments, questions? Uh, Lauren, go ahead. I just mostly wanted to, to thank you. This has been really helpful. And I think just um, continuing ongoing communication. I mean, obviously in these unprecedented times, trying to understand as you all are dealing with budget deficits and we're trying to figure out, you know, what we, what we can cut for this year. You know, if we have better information about where gaps either the state might be able to fill or if, you know, if we do get federal funds, what things might be able to, might be better to kind of put on hold because they're the kinds of projects we could um, put stimulus dollars towards, you know, mm -hmm. better to pause some infrastructure because that's easier to get dollars to or something. That kind of advice um, would be, would be great to just understand what you're hearing and seeing about, you know, what, I know it's kind of crystal ball right now, so it's hard to say, um, but just appreciate, you know, the staying in touch as much as possible so we can all do our best, you know, knowing we're 
have these the budget shortfalls and also you know greater needs from our community that we want to be addressing as well as we can of course so that's it thanks uh, dan go ahead i i want to echo the gratitude that the other city councilors have expressed for the four of you coming tonight and taking the time to talk with us through some of these issues and i you know i'll echo bill's take on on this which you know is that we're having to deal with more demand for social services that we haven't traditionally provided in a time where we're facing these budget shortfalls which is probably just a micro version of what you're dealing with on the state level um but it obviously is causing us this type of distress um and need for additional resources so to the extent that money comes from the federal government and passed can be passed through to municipalities for these projects we certainly we will spend it well and wisely um, in providing some of these essential services um, moving forward you know if there's any way that any of you would prefer to have us um, keep in touch as things I know things can move quickly um, we're certainly all ears for that uh, Connor Lauren and myself are the legislative committee and really we're we're policy we were formulators but we can certainly extend to any type of uh communicators and uh people to go in between when when things start to happen if we can help uh in any way so i wanted to offer that as well okay you know i just wanted to mention um not to open up a whole conversation but one thing we didn't mention this evening was the other pull on our financial resources is, are the schools in the city and, and around the state who are like local communities are taking on a lot of a bigger burden than ever before at a time when the resources are not there to meet the, the demands that are being placed on them. So it's just another thing we all need to keep in mind is schools are looking for more support as well, educators and, and uh, staff at the schools. and. So we just, that's another pull on the financial resources that we have to keep in mind as we move forward. I, you know, I think this is, is helpful to sit, you know, in a formal meeting, but it would, I think, be more helpful if at some point, maybe the legislative committee or the, you know, the committee would bill, if we could have more informal meetings just to keep us updated um because i didn't know what the issue with the railroad was um and so i don't know if i don't know what it is i don't know how to you know if i can fix it but in the old days when i was mayor um as much as i hate early morning meetings i was dragged up to the um the state house at 7 30 every tuesday morning and we sat there and this was when we were birthing pilot um we were there every tuesday and we buttonholed our legislative delegation and talked to them about the reality of the state not paying anything to be here um and it does you know but to to find a way to to talk to us um there's six of us those of us in the senate have a much bigger territory but it's helpful to know what's going on i think the cities have always they're at the bottom line when the state doesn't come up with the resources to deal with mental health issues homeless issues the bottom line is they're on the city streets and the city has to deal with them or you know let them freeze and sit there and fortunately we don't do that so i think staying in touch is really important that we uh we continue to know what's going on and if you come to the state house at 7 30 i won't meet with you <laughs> noon noon is good it's good to know thank you well, Mayor, it's turned into a uh, Senator Cummings. It's turned into a, you know a nine hundred and nineteen thousand uh, dollar coffee bit. So you did your job. We tried. Well done. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll echo what Senator Cummings said. That it 
in what Dan was saying that we could have communications more regular, whether they be email or, or quick phone calls on a more regular basis, even though these with the whole council are good too, but I know we'll be in a lot of Zoom meetings. Your meetings are probably long as it is. So you can't always do that. So I think more regular communications yeah. would be good. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, great. Any other further comments or questions for anyone? Uh, yes, okay. I wanted to uh, quickly mention something. I ride uh, my bike uh, regularly on our uh, beautiful new bicycle pass. And I noticed, like, uh, just going back to the railroad conversation, that uh, the uh, place, uh, uh, multiple spots where uh, uh, the, the, this new perfect pavement has been uh, damaged uh, to the point where you can actually can feel it when you ride on top of it. Uh, I realized that it's not, it makes no sense to repave it, but uh, it's definitely something that has been affected by the uh, new tracks being laid in and all this heavy machinery riding on the top of the bicycle pass. Okay. Oh, I have to yeah, go ahead. Take a note of that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again um, for taking the time, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Thank Best you. Thank you all with this new session. Right. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, where's the lead button on this? Thing? Ah. <laughs> lead. Strictly for the I, on this topic, um, right. legislators don't necessarily need to stay on, but. Do you feel the need to come back and revisit your list or is it good after that conversation? Just trying to decide whether to put it on another agenda. No, I'm, is it a question for the council? Yeah, I just, okay. our plan was to, after this conversation to put the, the legislative agenda back on and finalize it. But you know, my impression at least was that we don't need to do that based on this conversation. But, I agree. I don't think anything's changed. Okay. I think you'll agree with that information. Yep. Thanks. Yeah. Want, did we want to put non-citizen voting on it just so that they have the clear okay. message? Yep. We could just put that. I don't think we need to have it on an agenda again. But. I will do that. Yeah, That's we just good. have something about the charter changes, but we can be specific. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay. Super. Uh, Mayor, can you take a comment on the legislative agenda? Uh, sure. Uh, I believe now is an opportune time to have the legislature being that uh, for the next year uh, legislative process is probably going to happen remotely. Um, it's an opportune time to address the parking issue, to do some planning around what satellite parking by legislators and lobbyists might uh, create a positive impact on, on downtown parking uh, congestion. Uh, the economics of the hotel and the garage are very iffy and so uh, we may need to address, we still do need to address parking and that would be an opportune time because it's not uh, such a burning issue while people are working remotely. Um, so I think that, that that's one that getting the legislature engaged in discussing whether or not satellite parking at the junction or out at the uh, Route 2 uh, rotary, places like that and using potentially light rail or passenger rail to get into the village is is worthy of discussion thank you yeah, yeah thank you Stephen. and uh, maybe that could be a part of our, our follow-up conversations um okay any other further comments on this okay um all right so on to our COVID 19 update uh so i assume for this we are turning things over to cameron Oh, uh, Donna, yes. You Go ahead, Donna. You reversed. You um, number oh, eight. Oh, that all right. Transportation. That's right. Let, we need to do that. So, my apologies. Uh, so, um, revisiting the alternative transportation uh, fund allocation. To, um, well, from the from the parking fund. Um, so, for this, I'm going to turn things over to Bill. Uh, this hopefully this is reasonably quickly. A few years ago, um, as we were entering into our uh, alternate transportation plans, Montpelier uh, 
had a good name for it. Um, it's slipping my, my mind. So help me out. But anyway, we had a, the alternate transportation plan with the bike paths and all things through the city. And the then city council wanted to make sure that there was a dedicated funding stream to help do some of these projects, which was a fine idea. And at that point, we had just, uh, I think, raised parking rates. And the anticipation was we were going to have a fairly significant surplus in the parking fund. And so the council set, um, and, and as I recall, this was done fairly quickly. It was an idea that was thought of at a meeting and approved at the same meeting. Uh, there wasn't a lot of financial vetting to it. And um, the council approved a 5% allocation from the parking fund to go to alternate transportation with the logic being that, you know, cars coming into the downtown, creating the congestion, um, you know, their fees they're paying for parking are to help create alternate solutions. And, and it was fine. Uh, and at the time that was around $42,000. Uh, and then I think the next year uh, was determined that rather than make it be a percent, it would just become a hard number. It would become $42,000. Um, and, and that's where we've kept it over the years, and it has funded a lot of great things. But one of the pieces that got, I think, missing in that conversation was what happens when the parking fund is no longer uh, generating sufficient revenues even to cover its, its core costs. And so what we saw this past year, um, you know, the fiscal year we're in and last summer when we had to shut parking down completely is, you know, huge, as we mentioned, huge rifle revenue losses. And next thing you know, we were getting, uh, and again, nobody did anything wrong here, but sort of requests for use of this money. And we're like, there's no, there's no money here. <laughs> it's like, we've, we furloughed our employees. We're not, you know, there's no 42,000. We're in like negative 600,000 here. And so, um, so we felt it was important, I think, because we were kind of made it just a staff, you know, determination that there was no money, um, that the council weigh in on this. And I, so our recommendation, obviously, oh, obviously, our recommendation is that, that if you want to continue this policy of using parking funds for this purpose, it should be conditioned that there is sufficient revenue in the parking fund above expenses and that it should probably be a percentage of that, I don't want to call it profit, but that surplus, that, that fund balance that can be used um, toward these purposes rather than, you know, once you set a number, there's nothing. I mean, you always have, you, we always have the option of putting in our capital plan, maybe not this year, putting in our capital plan an allocation for alternate transportation and it just would be funded out of the general fund. So it's not like we're necessarily saying there would not be alternate transportation funds. But if it's going to be tied to parking and particularly right now, um, you know, our professional uh, uh, suggestion is there's no way to sustain it. There's no way to fund it right now. So that's our, our suggestion is that we, we could, go back to what I believe was the original intent of the council, which was we have extra money, let's use it, not to pay it out of this fund, regardless of whether the fund is performing. So that logic makes sense to me. I mean, I remember that being passed and we did not consider that prospect that the parking fund would not have generated a surplus. Any other thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Uh, Donna, go ahead. Um, I too was there when actually Jessica uh, uh, Eggerly Walsh, Wal Welch, Walsh, uh, never said her last name that much, made the motion. And it was all done pretty quickly and with good intention. She was afraid that it might, 5% might be less than 42 and she wanted to stabilize it, was I remember from the discussion. And I like the idea of 5%. It's reasonable for both groups if it goes up, if it goes down. I would like the cap though to be increased up to 45,000. That would be another flash and beacon for a crosswalk. And it would be an even number and it's been at 42 for a long time and hopefully it'll get back up there. So that's, I, I think it's a great idea and that's what I would endorse the 5% at a cap with 45,000. Seems fair to me. Uh, Jack, go ahead. If that's a motion, I second it. Was that was that a motion, Donna? Sure, sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> All right, so we have a, a motion and a second. Further discussion on this? If it's possible to make public comment. Um, oh, yes. Yes. Um, please uh, go go right ahead. Uh, great. So um, i turn camera on so you guys know I'm not a faceless drone. Uh, my name is Dayton Kreitz, and I am uh, a recent chair of the Complete Streets Committee. Um, and I'm joined here by Constantinos with the uh, MTIC Committee. Um, basically, I, I'm certainly just here to say I think it sounds very prudent to say when we don't have enough money in the parking fund, 5% of zero is zero, and that's that makes perfect sense to me. I would like to either push back or explore the idea of the cap. Um, certainly times are tough now, but we're going to get through COVID, and if, I think if anyone has seen um, the increase in people being outside and um, putting masks on and supporting Onion River Outdoors, I think the desire for outdoor recreation, including active transportation, walking, biking places, is only going to increase in coming years. Um, so I'd like to suggest 5% tied to that revenue, but why have a cap? And would suggest removing a cap. Um, would uh, anyone else like to comment? I, I see uh, Constantinos and Elizabeth, you turned your cameras on. Uh, Constantinos, go ahead. Yeah, I'd also like to advocate for not having a cap uh, on it as well. I mean, we might be going into austerity now, but hopefully that won't last forever. And hopefully we don't want to be hamstrung in the future when the good times do return. Um, so MTIC is committed to reviewing the city's transportation infrastructure and making these recommendations to the council uh, on how we can make it safer and easier for all users to get around. And the ATF is what gives us that capability to implement those solutions. So uh, MTIC has discussed uh, different ways we could provide that input. And uh, city manager did mention the CIP is one way, but uh, the CIP is for mostly big items. It doesn't put in those smaller discretionary items that we have. So for example, we have a budget item for the Complete Streets Committee where they do their education and programming. So some, like they give out lights to pedestrians and cyclists in the winter time or do various educational programming. Uh, the fund has also funded different planning efforts. So the Barry Main Street scoping study, the downtown master plan, uh, there was money that was contributed from the ATF for those planning functions. And like uh, Donna mentioned, the rapid flashing beacons are another thing that are paid for uh, out of this discretionary oh, fund. And these things might not actually get um, be material enough to be in the CIP. So we might be losing out on some of that um, without this, this fund. So, um, you know, I think by not capping the, AT the ATF, you do provide the committee that's actually charged with advising you on, on transportation infrastructure an opportunity to actually implement those changes. Uh, and just to let you know, also, there are some controls over the ATF. Uh, there is an application process. We do have a rubric where we do review any applications for those funds that come in from the public. So it's not just, you know, the, the funds can go anywhere willy-nilly. We do have a process to um, put them in, in places that are actually going to have some sort of impact. And we do review them and have uh, votes and discussion on it at the committee. So uh, with that, I'd just like to make sure that you guys know that this, this fund is not, uh, it, it's very useful for us. And we do carry forward the funds every year as well. So you did mention that there is surpluses occasionally. And uh, some of that is on purpose because we do see bigger ticket projects coming forward. And we want to carry forward some of those funds that we save to pay for something bigger. So for example, traffic calming is something that we've been talking a lot about. And some of those uh, projects might be might be rather large if we're talking about re resurfacing a street with speed bumps or whatever treatment is going to help um, that specific whatever problem it is. So um, having those funds that we can carry forward and in lean years, for example, a year like this year where 5% is zero, that's perfectly fine. But if 5% ends up being 50,000, um, you know, we, we will find good uses for it and the public is always uh, encouraged to put in applications for um, for anything that they feel would, would assist them. So I think that's probably fine because it's it's the percentage of what what the fund you know is has cleared so I, I think that logic makes sense um, and I, I would I just want to say to both gentlemen um, the, the funds have been used really well. I think you have both have managed the processes really well and it does a lot of great things. So I don't think there's any question from us about how they're being used. It's just, there's no, there's no money there to use. Um, and, and to Constantinus's point about the capital fund, I, I think he's correct that no individual project might rise to the level of a capital thing. But we do have a couple categories normally. And again, I'm saying normally because I think this year all bets are off. But normally in our capital plan, we have, for example, we carry 10,000 each year 
for just downtown projects that really Montpelier Live uses. And those, they can be very one or $2,000 projects. We just carry that money. The same thing with parks and cemetery, we just carry a set number. So there's no reason other than limitations on the dollars that at some point in the future, the city council couldn't put in an annual 42,000 or 25,000 appropriation for alternate transportation without it being limited to specific projects. It would just be, these are capital type projects that I go to this fund. So it's not completely prohibitive. I'm not saying advising we do it and certainly I can almost guarantee it won't be in our budget proposal this year, but it's not out of the question. As you think about other places to go, that is, that's one option. Uh, go ahead, Donna. And then Elizabeth, did you want to speak? If not, that's okay. You can let Elizabeth go first. She hasn't talked yet. <laughs> I'll go after you, Elizabeth. Go ahead. Oh, but we but can't hear you. hear you now, even though you're unmuted. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> she's, she's probably going to go call you. So, okay. I'll, I'll talk while she's calling. How's that? Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> the thing that I see about the cap is that there are other projects that involve things dealing with pedestrians, cyclists, non vehicle related that are in our CIP that are very separate from the funds that this committee gets. I feel this committee is really blessed to have any funds to deal with. This is like a discretionary pot that I don't know if any other committee has a pot to deal with. And so, but yet I do feel like it needs to be contained and that within the CIP, yes, there are projects that the MTIC can support and bring to the CIP group and DPW that will go directly in there, totally separate from the AT, ATF funds. So I think there's a different issue here from the big, big projects and the things that are more included in the FT. ATF funds. So that's why I feel more comfortable with a cap. Okay, thank you. Other thoughts? Uh, Lauren, go ahead. I was just curious, and Bill might have the answer. What? So excluding this crazy year, like what's what's a normal variation of, you know, is 5%, so that particular year that this was established, 42,000 was the 5%, if I'm hearing you right. I was just curious what the fluctuation or how stable that normally is and what 5% usually is. So one of the interesting things about parking revenue, unlike other revenue, is that typically, you know, you don't raise rates, you know, Parking, I mean, it's changing a little bit now that we're going to park mobile and some of these other things. But, you know, when you think about parking, we th sort of think about it in coin increments. So you don't really raise your rates a 2% one year because of cost of living and 3% another year. It's every number, you know, you raise them a quarter like every 10 years. <laughs> you know, it goes from $1.25 to $1.50 an hour, $1.50 to $1.75 an hour. And um, and it sort of depends on what's going on around you. So the parking fund tends to get like a big jump in revenue. And for a couple of years, it makes, it has a fairly large surplus, at least in theory, because the costs are just going up. And then over time, the revenue kind of stays, I'm going to do this all on the same camera, right? Revenue kind of stays about the same, assuming the demand is the same, but the costs, you know, are rising. So if we were really excellent money managers, right, we take all that surplus to just hold it because what's going to happen is eventually the costs are going to go past it and you'd need that money to kind of cover it until you do the next big rate increase. So what, what happened was we had just done a rate increase and we were projecting, you know, a fairly large, the, the big gap and the council was like, whoa, let's take, and, and, don't blame them. They were trying to figure out a way to do something good. This isn't a fault, but it was like, let's take that money and use it. Well, number one, we never, we actually, the reality is we didn't get as much of a gap as we thought. And secondly, now, you know, the last couple of years, we've been sort of breaking even or barely breaking even. And now, of course, now the bottom's falling out. And one of the things that we're looking to do as we rebuild is maybe take a look at things that were in the parking fund and should they be, in, you know, you know, don't waste a good crisis, right? Here's a chance to maybe reallocate our funding and look at how we're, we're using our, our dollars uh, wisely. So 
as we rebuild the parking fund, ideally we could build something like this into it as a regular cost. But, um, you know, so I, I thought it was a convoluted way of saying it's hard to predict what a surplus might be in a given year because um, the revenues are really, you know, flat, really. Once you raise the rate, you're kind of at that revenue number for the next bunch of years until you change rates again. Um, we're going to go Jackson, Lauren. Hearing, uh, hearing Bill's description of how this works, I think it, uh, it makes sense to me to retain the cap as a way of uh, <clears throat> giving us the opportunity to not necessarily say no to anything over the cap, but at least to trigger a conversation when uh, if we get to the point where we have uh, a surplus beyond that uh, beyond that level. And so I, it makes me think that keeping that discretion within the city council is a good way to go. Um, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I was, I guess I'm just thinking, I mean, the same conversation is happening at the state level with the transportation fund and, you know, how are we really prioritizing investments in alternative ways of getting around and, you know, are some of those ultimately reducing, you know, the number of times you need to repay for roads and that kind of thing. So, I mean, to me, I would love to obviously you know, unfortunately not right at this moment, but like longer term, think about, you know, could we make that? Um, and maybe that's how Bill was describing it, more of a stable, predictable fund that could be, um, you know, part of our infrastructure instead of this, what sounds kind of unpredictable. And um, we're seeing this year, not, not reliable year to year, but really try to get to a point where we're making a kind of consistent investment in this piece of our, um, of our transportation. Yeah, that, that makes sense to me in terms of, um, you know, maybe not this year, but moving into the future, uh, just having part of our budget be like, no, let's, and, and have it not necessarily tied to, um, to the parking. If this is something we value, then we should put money towards it. Um, uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, maybe I'm not understanding people's interpretation of what Bill said, but this fund has gotten it's $42,000 every year until this year. Correct. And, so and, the and, fund has fluctuated. The city has had less money because we made a flat rate. The, the uh, alternative funds have been steady since the first time it was changed from 5%. So just the fund uh, itself is nothing you can control, Lauren, because cars will do what cars do with weather and everything else. Uh, but the fund itself for this committee, the alternate funds have been steady since it was instituted. Right, yeah. because we set it at a set amount. To be clear, cars won't do anything. The people driving the cars is, will do what they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna do. Um, but the, you know, I, I, you know, so just if I were setting this up from scratch, I mean, I, I believe it actually ought to be in our capital plan. I think this, if it's a value and a priority, it ought to be in our base budget. I, I, I recall what happened was we already had, we were working on building up the capital plan and we, we had a sort of plan for repaving streets and all those things, which, you know, we're still could be doing a better job at. <clears throat> so, so we were maxed out of money and the council was trying to find additional money to, to put to this. And I was like, well, let's use the parking. Nothing wrong with that. It's a policy decision. This may, like I, I'm saying maybe this is the opportunity as we're recalibrating coming out of this and putting our money back into different places, it might be the time to say this is just important to us and we're gonna put a sum of money in our capital plan every year for this. And that's just what it's gonna be. And you know, does that mean that's 45 or 50,000 that isn't a paved street? That's, you know, it's a priority decision for the elected officials to make. Instead of risking it on what the parking rate is and what the weather is and what the cars drivers do and those kind of things. Well, maybe if we move forward with a, at least moving it to interpretation of the, um, the, the surplus as opposed to the total amount of the fund tonight, cap or no cap, 
Uh, maybe right. this is something we can revisit as a part of our, our budget discussion. Um, there was another hand. Um, well, so actually, first of all, um, uh, Elizabeth, I don't know if you if we can hear you now, but I want to give you that opportunity. Um, and then uh, Alex. No, no, I'm not meant to speak. Oh, it's yes. okay. No, oh, no, we can hear you. Uh, miracle of miracles. I am having, Wes is going to be working on this computer next week to fix the sound at last. Um, hallelujah. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm really glad the direction this conversation is going in. Uh, you know, in the, as MTIC was working on the transportation plan, uh, one of the important points was to uh, really support my pillars, um, uh, you know, uh, transportation uh, uh, work with for biking, walking, etc. And so, uh, I I just want to applaud the council for the the direction you're taking this conversation. Um, of course, I'm I'm on MTIC. I think that the work we do is very important. So I'm I'm advocating for no cap, but um, at this point, um, that may not be relevant. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Alex, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I'm just uh, curious if another variable has been factored in into the parking conversation uh, from a point of view of uh, many organizations uh, uh, who are going to allow employees to perpetually stay uh, at home. So some people who currently, who before COVID have uh, worked out of the downtown offices may not be coming back. So as much as we want to, the demand may not uh, return to where it was. So just for capacity planning sake, it's uh, just another uh, variable uh, uh, to look into. And probably state might be one of the bigger organizations downtown. So uh, like if, if there is any way to predict what it's gonna be like, uh, uh, at least for the state employees, it will be like a big chunk of uh, potentially predictable numbers. That's something we've given a lot of thought to. And of course we have no way of knowing what that's gonna look like, but you're absolutely, I'm sure there's gonna be some subset of organizations that choose to continue working remotely. That's a good question. Okay. Um, so there is a, uh, uh, yes, Constitus, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on uh, the piece of putting the money back into the CIP at some point uh, and kind of putting the, having the ATF part of the CIP is that I think uh, like I mentioned, having some discretionary control over it from the committees would still be important. This way we don't lose out on some of the programming that we've been doing in the past or uh, if projects come up, for example, um, covered bike parking was something that we were talking about. You know, that's like a five or $6,000 expense, you know, right off the bat. And if someone uh, puts in an application for that and knows of a good location um, and could be part of the downtown master plan, for example, uh, as part of the street streetscapes, we'd like to still have that freedom to do projects like that on a on a rolling basis as they come in, where the CIP, in my understanding, is that it's kind of it meets once a year, uh, and you go through all your projects and you prioritize them, and um, we would lose out on some of that control, and we could lose out on some some projects that we could do over the summer, or, uh, rapid flashing beacons when we identify other places that might be problematic. It's just um, I, I think it's important to keep that discretionary piece. So I, I just respond to that and say it could be structured that way. Uh, you know, again, using the Montpelier Alive, the, the downtown 10,000, um, we don't scrub what's going into that. Sometimes they say that it's basically, here's an allocation that Montpelier Alive can use for downtown projects as they come up and, and deal with that. And if there's a change to that, like, you know, a couple of years ago, I said a couple, I'm dating myself, several years ago, we had a big project and we knew, you know, we talked to them and said, hey, we're gonna need that 10,000 for the next couple of years to go to this project, but it was for downtown. And they said, yeah, that's a great project. I think it was new sidewalks or something like that. So they were they were okay, but it was done, you know, collaboratively. We didn't just take it from them. So, you know, if we were gonna build a new bike path, let's say, and we needed matching money, 
you might go to your group and say, hey, can we take two years of this, 20, you know, 50 grand to match the bike path? And you might say, great, you know, that meets our need. Um, but it's not, you know, it could be set up where you would, you know, it's an allocation or where you would make, you would have sort of control over it like you do now. Thank you. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I guess along those lines, Bill, Corey has been very good to come to the MTIC for matching funds. And the group has been very good being there for matching funds because the projects were related. So it definitely works very well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, it's, it's been a great program. Cool. That's encouraging. Uh, okay, so any further comments on this, uh, on the motion uh, that's been seconded? It's uh, just to, to recap, uh, as I understand it, it's to have the 5% come from the surplus of the parking fund uh, with a cap. And uh, Donna, the cap was 45,000, is that right? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right, any further discussion on that particular piece of this? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so the motion passes. Um, thank you, and thanks for um, to all of you who came out to to chat with us about this. I appreciate you uh, taking time and uh, you know, getting the input from from your committee. It's really <laughs> valuable. So, all right, um, Madam, Madam Mayor. Yes. Before you go on to the next topic, um, I think we may have skipped over the consent agenda. <gasps> Oh, we did skip the consent agenda. Oh, I'm all about skipping things tonight. Let's do that, and then we'll take a break. Is that okay? Okay. I'll, I'll move that we accept the consent agenda. I'll second. Uh, <laughs> I like that people are still using the two thing. That just makes me very happy. Um, so, all right, we got a motion and a second. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, it is now 8.30. Uh, let's, what do you think? To uh, five minutes, 10 minutes? Uh, this one was slightly longer than some other ones we've gotten recently. There's obviously been a lot of movement and the uptick of cases in Washington County and Orange County. Um, I do wanna say that the governor has been very clear in why he's putting out the guidance that he is. Um, really focusing on want versus need of things to stay open. Um, he did extend his state of emergency through December 15th. The new guidelines, um, at this point, I am sure most everyone is aware of them, but um, starting November 13th, he has banned multi-household gatherings, whether inside or out, public spaces or private. Um, they really discuss why. 51% of cases associated with an outbreak in Vermont right now are because of a private event or social gatherings. Starting on the 13th at 10 p.m., they've also closed all bars and other social clubs. Restaurants can stay open, but they have to be closed to in-person service after 10 and have to switch to go services. Um, there is now also a more stringent requirement for folks to keep logs of people who come in and Vermonters who sign those logs are um, stating they're going to comply with contract tracers. Rec oh, I'm sorry. Returning college students are now required to quarantine for 14 days, even in state. Requiring, they're requiring telework for those who can um, and discouraging in-person meetings. They're also pausing recreational sports leagues, which I'll um, explain a bit later how that impacts our rec department. And they also stated they're going to be releasing more guidance on gatherings this Friday. So I, I will send a update to y'all at that time. The hospital um, has some updates as well. Um, Health Services has ordered hospitals to go back to tighter restrictions, which includes no visitors with very limited exceptions. Again, our travel map has been suspended and all travel into Vermont requires a 14 day quarantine or a seven day quarantine and a negative test. The state has also said that they'll be using state resources and local um, officials to help them 
conduct safety and compliance checks at folks where people um, gather. So our modeling update is I think the biggest change from last uh, time y'all met is there has been a pretty steep increase of cases. In the last 23 days, we've added a thousand cases in the state. Vermont currently has the second highest reproduction rate of the virus in the country right now. Um, currently we have 593 active cases this week, which is 400 more than we had four days ago. The state attributes this to the Halloween surge from folks gathering um, and socializing over Halloween. So um, that's really, really worrying. The state did reach out to us and, there, and met with us this week to discuss um, emergent needs in Washington County and Orange County, and we'll be helping sort of craft better communications for, for us to share with residents. To comply with those requirements, the city is closing City Hall. I will also say that Dr. Levine told us specifically that he would like to see all public buildings closed currently, just to emphasize how serious this is. Um, this is not a spurious decision that we made. Um, we really were asked to close by health officials. Um, we were also canceling um, sort of by proxy all the in-person council meetings that we had set up before. However, we know that people have urgent business inside City Hall. And so folks can call the departments that they have questions for, and we can still accommodate appointments on a case-by-case -case basis as needed. And most things can be accomplished on the phone or online at this point, but um, we know that that is a detriment to some. Um, also to comply with new state requirements, the senior center is suspending in-person classes for right now. It's continuing its online classes and its foot clinics. Um, and the recreation department is suspending rec center rentals for um, any sports leagues. They are continuing um, childcare for right now. Um, there is a new uh, and interesting thing is the state is expanding its testing capacity. There's ad they added new testing locations in Burlington, Middlebury, Waterbury, Rutland, and Brattleboro. And they also are increasing their testing at the Barry Auditorium from nine to three. Um, uh, they've had quite a few at this point, but the ones that are upcoming are tomorrow, Friday, Monday the 23rd, and Tuesday the 24th, and you can call 211 for a appointment to get tested. Um, I also included in the memo our community meal information, and another way is still looking for donations for folks. Do you guys have any questions? Go ahead, Jack. Uh, thanks, Cameron. Um, I was just, I just thought of this from an article in the Washington Post uh, this morning. Do you know if there's any progress on uh, development of a COVID-19 contact tracing app for uh, cell phones in Vermont? A number of, they are in existence for a number of states, um, but Vermont is not on the list at this point. Um, I feel like they would have told us that because they were talking about their contact tracing. They are upping their contract tracing uh, number. They're going to be including some of the National Guard members from Vermont into their contract tracing ranks, but I will ask them if that's something that they're going to be considering as an app. Thanks. Okay, um, thanks Jack. Lauren, go ahead. And then Dan. I was just, just uh, in response to that, I had heard um, Dr. Levine at a re recent press conference um, on this topic saying that they were watching what other states were doing and basically until they saw a proven example or model, they didn't want to spend their limited resources on developing that. Um, so I think it was a little bit of wait and see and if other states kind of had something that we could mimic, um, but he hadn't yet seen it as something that had proven so useful that they were spending their, their time on. Sorry. Oh, uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. Uh, I had a question about, you know, we're seeing this uptick in uh, Washington County cases. Have they broke that down into communities where, where in the communities they're seeing the uptick within Washington County? Um, they said adults primarily and adults who are socializing with others. Um, there has been some back and forth with the state and gen not just us, all the localities about what level of information we can get to make sure that we target our communications to the right folks. Um, 
And that's not, I think just because we're such small communities, they're not going to identify specifics other than right now, it's primarily adults and adults who are socializing. I said, what about geographically? Are they finding it, you know? Oh, um, Montpelier. They've broken it down by region mostly. Um, so I, I don't think I have any more specifics than that really. Um, they do have a heat map on their website, um, but it just says general numbers. Uh -huh. Thanks. All right, any further questions? Um, just to um, further that a little bit, I, I had at one point seen a breakdown of the Washington County numbers by city or by town and uh yeah I it definitely exists it just isn't um, it's like one of those longer term maps where it says like how many cases you had and do have but it doesn't tell you anything more than that right mm. right it's, it's, i'm going to tell you what community that is it almost seems like a historical map where they and that may be sort of a secondary tier and and the message may be it's washington county so it's us it's whether it's an outbreak in the northeast section of washington county or not we should all be acting as if it's in our communities um they, oh i'm sorry no go ahead i was just going to say they also are trying very hard to not be very specific in what they t like publicly discuss mm -hmm. because they're really trying to discourage uh, to for lack of a better word witch hunting uh, who has the virus i think that's impacting smaller communities much harder than it is ours but um, still, a uh, still something that could be possible. Yeah, fair enough. All right. Mayor, will you entertain a one minute comment, 30 second comment on this issue? Indeed, Stephen, go right ahead. Okay. The impact on those requiring bathrooms is inordinate and it's no excuse for not having secured the inside doors to both the upstairs and downstairs hallway and allowing city hall bathrooms to stay open, send a cleaner in once a day. Uh, it's, it's really unconscionable to ignore that opportunity to provide restrooms. You could even have used the, have the police buzz people in, but that it's not something to just kick down the road. Secondly, we should all not just turn a blind eye to the constitutional issue of banning assembly. Freedom of assembly is protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution. I understand we're in a pandemic, but we don't roll over like sheep without questioning uh, freedom of assembly. You know, to, to tell people they can't have dinner with their neighbors is absurd. So uh, I just need to speak up on that topic. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Um, any other um, comments? Okay. All right, so we have an infrastructure update uh, from, I assume from Donna. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm here tonight uh, for the annual infrastructure update. Um, joining me is Zach Blodgett and also Kurt Monica, and I apologize that we did not have Kurt's, um, our deputy director's name on the front of the PowerPoint. Um, complete oversight on our part. Um, so um, before we start talking about what we accomplished this year, I just wanted to sort of reflect and acknowledge on the changes um, that our department encountered um, COVID changed everything for us. And so typically we would be sitting here, the three of us, and we were talking, we would be talking about how well we managed all the projects that were on our plate. And, um, but COVID not only affected our ability to undertake projects, it affected how we did the work of our department when we did the work whether we did the work and, um, and, and we had to deal with ever-changing rules, short staff situations, 
um, and more. So we're feeling a little bit awkward and a little bit guilty that we can't come to this meeting tonight and do what we normally do, which is proudly present that we succeeded at everything that was on our plate. But I, um, I do, as the director, want to say that that was out of our hands and that our staff um, rallied, did the work we could, and there were times when we just could not not even engage with contractors, so we didn't have the option of completing work. Um, and um, so I am going to, for the most part, turn this over to um, Zach and Kurt. Um, and um, you'll see that we've created this PowerPoint. Everything that's in red is um, our items that were identified as needing to be done this year. Um, they haven't been done. Um, the black um, is what we were able to um, engage in and, and deal with. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Zach right now and um, all three of us will just join in as appropriate throughout the whole rest of the conversation. Zach? Thank you, Donna. Um, so we'll first go over the, the strategic plan goals uh, that were outlined this year. Um, so uh, the first one was Clarendon Ave uh, phase two road reconstruction. Uh, that is now- Excuse me, complete. Zach, uh, I'm sorry for the interruption, but are you, okay. are you share screening your presentation? Because I'm not seeing it. I'm not, I don't have that capability. So if Cameron okay. wants to run through the PowerPoint, um, she can, or we can just kind of talk along. I just want to just check what, what you were doing with the PowerPoint. Zach, I've given you the authority to share your screen now. It should work now. Can you do that? Um, yeah, one second while we get that up. Cameron, can you give uh, Kurt the authority to do that? He actually has it. I'm on my phone and he's on the laptop. Oh, okay. You should all have the ability to do that. Yeah. There we go. And then just begin the slide. Do you go to slideshow? Up top. To the right. All right. <clears throat> so of the first strategic plan goal, uh, it was Clarendon Ave phase two road reconstruction. Uh, we are wrapping that up this week. They're just finishing up their the final topsoiling. Um, we have got a lot of uh, actually really good feedback from the residents. Um, very pleased and happy with the contractor and the project and just uh, um, just a lot of compliments uh, on that project. Uh, the other, the second uh, strategic goal that we had was Taylor Street, uh, the stormwater and the road reconstruction. Um, that is mostly complete. The lights are still, uh, they still need to go up, but uh, for the most part, the, the road is paved, the sidewalks are in, uh, the, uh, the dry wells are in, the, the, the stormwater treatment is in. Um, so we're, we're now really just waiting on the lighting component. Uh, Chestnut Hill was another uh, goal that we had um, that was completed uh, this actually this past week. On Monday, they finished the paving uh, up there. Um, and then in addition to Chestnut, we had uh, paving of streets, crack ceiling and markings, which were also all completed. Uh, in red, you'll see the Grant Street sidewalk repairs. Uh, that project was not completed, it was deferred. Um, we have received a grant for that project and it will be completed we plan to complete it in FY22. Um, Route Road Bridge, we had um, in the strategic plan, we had it said that we needed to come up with a funding strategy for Route Road. Um, we have allocated money uh, to keep this, uh, the, to get this bridge funded, um, but it, it will be largely dependent on receiving the grant fund um, during this next uh, grant term. And then lastly is the Moat, Moat property, which the construction manager lost, um, we've been unable to complete last year due to the required environmental studies and then the construction manager uh, lost their site contractor and then they have un been unable to find a replacement uh, to date, so. Um, 
So in summary of the FY21 projects that were, um, major uh, the majority of these were outlined in the CIP program. Uh, we, for streets, we completed Clarendon Ave, Jordan Street, Redstone, Taylor Street. Um, Memorial Drive leveling was an addition that, uh, that we included this year. Uh, Bailey Ave, Bridge Deck um, was also added. And then as I just spoke, we finished up crack sealing and pavement markings. Um, the sidewalks along Taylor Street were completed. The storm drain on Taylor Street was completed. Uh, as I said before, we completed the, the Chestnut Hill Road stormwater project. Um, Scribner Street was planned, but still we haven't had um, enough time to get staff up there to complete that. Um, we will likely be up there uh, first thing in the spring. Um, if the weather holds out, we still might find ourselves some time to get up there, but um, I'm not I'm not holding my breath on that one because uh, we're getting a little bit late in the season. Um, and then for MRGP projects, we completed McKinley, Chestnut, Wheelock, and uh, Main Street. Um, for water projects, we completed Redstone East uh, in conjunction with the Clarendon Ave project. And then a project that was newly added to the list was the Murray and North College extension. Um, in addition, we for CSOs, we did install our six uh, monitors and three rain gauges, um, which are now operational. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about the projects that uh, we didn't get done. Um, so for street paving, uh, Dewey Street, Donnell, were planned around the Clarendon Ave projects in that same neighborhood. Um, that was a budgetary cut, so we weren't able to complete the paving on those two streets. Uh, and that's uh, similar for Westwood Drive, another um, deficit mitigation plan item. And also Cumming Street, um, we're just getting underway with that one. Uh, that is currently being converted to gravel with our uh, own staff. Um, so we're gonna, the pavement condition was so bad that we've decided to temporarily turn that street into gravel. Uh, next summer we plan to do in-house utility work on that street and then um, follow that up with paving. Uh, for bridges, as Zach noted, we didn't get the grant for Grout Road Bridge, so uh, we're going to continue to apply for that grant. Um, for storm drains and culverts, Main Street and Town Hill, we have a, a large culvert in that area that um, has begin beginning to fail. Uh, the bottom of the culvert um, has developed some holes and there's some sinkholes developing. In the, in the lawn of the property that the culvert runs under. Um, we just uh, don't have the funding for that right now. We're gonna apply for a grant for that project as well. Um, Phelps Street was gonna be a contracted uh, storm drain project. Um, that was a budgetary cut due to COVID uh, impacts. Um, Zach noted Scribner Street, uh, that's uh, still planned to be done in-house, uh, potentially in the spring. And then for utility work, um, uh, in front of the state house, there's a uh, a large. Um, it's really a constructed um, drop in the sewer main. It's an area we're not able to clean, so it uh, ends up you know, backing up the system a little bit because of um, you know that's a uh, incontinuity in the in the grade of the pipe. So that's a, a really big um, combined sewer overflow project that we want to do. We're hoping to do that next year. Um, Water, uh, Quinnell Drive was planned to be done in-house in the spring. We weren't able to do the work because of uh, the furloughs to staff and restrictions on construction activities. Um, and then there's a couple other small CSO projects that we're planning to do in-house that we didn't, we weren't able to get to because of the late start. Uh, that's Bailey and Sunnyside and um, one on Quinnell. All right, so here's a, a summary of the, um, the completed projects and you'll see on the right that there is a, a, an approximate goal slash target that we try to meet on an annual basis. Uh, so typically we're, our goal is two miles of roads paved. Um, this year we were able to get uh, a half a mile of resurfaced roads plus uh, we were able to do some leveling projects. So we were right, right around a mile worth of uh, uh, paving work this year. Um, for 
for sidewalks, we look, we look for to get around 444 square yards of concrete and 1,350 square yards of asphalt. And we were only able to get um, roughly, well, of a, of a reconstructed sidewalk, we got 267 square yards. And of new sidewalk added, uh, we were able to do 104 square yards. Um, for new sidewalks, we our goal is to eliminate gaps, which are identified in the uh, Montpelier motion plan or gaps identified by the um, MTEC committee. Um, uh, in addition, for crack sealing, we got uh, right around three and a half miles of road done, which was actually a really, that's a pretty good number for uh, for amount of crack sealing that was completed. Um, it, the, the goal and the target depends, um, it varies with uh, the severity of the road. <clears throat> For storm drains, we look to get around 1,200 feet completed a year, and this year we completed 600 feet of it. Uh, for stormwater MRGP, we're actually doing pretty well in, in that category. Uh, we completed four projects, um, and the the goal slash target we're on track. Um, that one is a, it's a little bit harder to explain because there's a, a whole bunch of tiered um, goals over the next 20 years. The first five years, we have to eliminate all of the um, high severity problems, which we only have a few remaining. So uh, we have a couple more years to do that. And then for CSOs, like I said before, we ended up uh, installing the six monitors. Uh, our, our goal and target is to uh, fully eliminate CSOs. And then for water projects, our steady state goal is 1500 linear feet a year. We were able to we were able to complete 1500 feet, uh, but that was uh, some of those projects were um, new lines like uh, Mur uh, Murray and North College. Uh, that was an extension. Um, it does bring in revenue, so it would it is good, but um, it doesn't it doesn't really fulfill the, the steady state target of replacing 1500 feet of existing mains per year. Uh, I should also note, though, that um, in this table, uh, we forgot to include the uh, work that was done at the rail crossing along Berry Street. So there's an additional 500 feet there, um, which that should be counted towards um, the existing infrastructure. And uh, with the sewer, again, we um, forgot to, om we omitted the Berry Street rail crossing. So we completed about a thousand feet of sewer line um, along Berry Street. And our, our annual target is around 1400 feet. All right, so next uh, I'm going to talk about the upcoming upcoming challenges uh, that we're facing this year and into next year. Um, so the first one is maintaining appropriate funding for infrastructure categories. Um, as you all know, because of COVID, we're having to make cuts on uh, some of them our projects. Uh, so that impacts the amount of work that we can do, um, which translate in which translates uh, to not meeting our steady state targets. Um, we deferred approximately 500,000 in equipment and projects uh, in FY20. Um, we also have reduced staffing levels with six positions that remain vacant in the department. Um, it also should be noted that typically we hire a construction inspector for summer projects, which we did not have this year. Um, in addition, the reduced staffing is limiting our capability or our ability to uh, complete in-house construction projects. Um, we are trying to diminish overtime uh, as as best as we can. Um, we have a we've had a change in leadership positions, uh, not just within our department, but uh, through a whole bunch of positions within the city, which is taking is required time to achieve a new normal um, and for us to restructure how, how we operate. Um, as it was stated a little bit earlier in today's meeting, the parking fund is no longer supporting the alternative transportation. Fund, uh, but now we passed the resolution uh, resolution tonight, so uh, it still will support it. Um, and then uh, the last last one on this page is the increase in public demands, resulting in more people from working from home and uh, noticing more issues. All right, so we'll um, continue with some additional challenges we'll be facing. Um, 
the water sewer master plans, they've, uh, they've hit five years this year and really need to be updated. Um, a lot of things have changed with the big project that we have uh, currently ongoing at the wastewater plant. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, to maintain compliance with our long-term control plan, which is um, our plan to essentially eliminate combined sewer overflows. There's some uh, regulatory requirements associated with that. Um, meeting net zero targets for fleet and equipment, uh, obviously with the, um, the reduced budget for equipment purchases, uh, it's going to be difficult to um, upgrade our fleet to meet those goals. Um, uh, also related to delayed equipment purchases is the more potential uh, equipment breakdowns. Um, because we're not replacing the equipment on our prescribed schedule, we're likely going to have to spend more money on repairs. Uh, funding for survey in order to develop uh, shovel-ready projects. We talked a little bit with the legislators about potential stimulus money. Um, you know, we have a couple small projects that we could get ready pretty quickly, but um, you know, the one that comes to mind is East State Street as kind of our next really big reconstruction projects and. Um, that's a fairly big undertaking just to do the survey work and, and, and design. And, and right now we don't have the funding available for that. Um, <clears throat> the, the changes in the CIP fund related to, to paving funding also will affect the water sewer master plans. Um, and that's because when we try to do projects again, like East State Street, we try to, um, you know, a couple of the infrastructure, the utility work with the um, with the CIP money for paving. So uh, just having that reduced CIP levels is gonna make it uh, more difficult to uh, meet the, the master plan goals. And then the last one is uh, COVID related operational changes. Um, really having, you know, um, restrictions on, uh, you know, how many people we have in the work zone and the safety um, equipment, wearing masks, things like that. Uh, just a lot of planning going on. You know, one thing I'm looking at is is how we separate our staff at the uh, treatment plants. You know, um, just a, a high risk area for um, you know losing our staff in that particular area, and potentially all at the same time, and not having anyone available to run the plant. So just a lot of you know planning ahead, and getting you know, as we're entering this next wave, um, we're really trying to stay ahead of potential issues associated with that. And then, you know, um, supporting new parklets to try to uh, support the businesses downtown, um, new interops needs, and, you know, assisting the school with um, you know, street closures so that they can comply with their safety guidelines. And that is pretty much it for our presentation. We open up to questions. All right, well, thank you. Um, okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Jack. Hi, this is uh, just a quick one. Um, there aren't that many people that live on, on Grout Road, but uh, but how critical is the uh, is the is the bridge issue? Are people in any danger of uh, being stuck on the wrong side of the bridge? Sure, I can. Um, so it's not uh, the bridge is an immediate um, is not an immediate risk of failure. The issue is um, getting heavy trucks over the bridge. So there's one there's one property that needs a new well drilled and uh, and the and the um, bridge currently can't support the load of that drill rig. So that's some of the urgency around it. Um, there are also you know some restrictions on you know how how large a fire truck or emergency vehicle could could access it. But man, the actual um, you know, pedestrian cars or not pedestrian cars, but the uh, personal vehicles are are fine to go over the bridge. Thanks this for the foreseeable next few years. Thank you. That'll be done. Other questions? Go ahead, Donna. Yeah, and then uh, Lauren. I I just can hear all your discouragement of what you haven't completed, but I want to tell you I see what you have completed and what you've coped with. And I salute your your work, and I know that you'll do the best you can under these very very trying circumstances. And I thank all of you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, Lauren, go ahead, and then Dan. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I also wanted to, I, you know, Donna starting off with, with apologies, like we're in unprecedented times and we all recognize that and appreciate all that you have gotten done. So I thank you. And, you know, it's been, it's been a hard time for everyone. And, you know, the, the list that you showed us of everything that you've gotten done is, is impressive to me. So thanks for everyone's hard work. Um, also wanted to say congrats on the standard offer agreement that we approved earlier, right? Yay, that was a good step forward. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, that's great to see. Um, and my only question was for the staffing issue, is it has just been hard to hire people or what's, or are we, have we stalled out on hiring because of our budget issues or could you just describe what, what's So happening? part of it is budget, has been budget issues. Um, each of the departments has been asked um, in a couple of different um, timelines to um, offer up um, the ability to move forward with a balanced budget. Um, and so that's part of it. Um, Zach, Kurt, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, some of it was the fact that um, kind of it was just um, kind of bad luck on our part. Um, we had a lot of vacancies when COVID hit, and it just caused a lot of stress on, um, you know, we had a hiring freeze uh, very early on, and we had vacant positions open when that happened. Um, and, you know, some of that is somewhat related to um, the inability to find good quality candidates. Um, we do need to look at um, our our union contract and we were up for um, a to revisit that and to update that but um, we're having a little bit of a hard time bringing new employees in so when we are making offers to people they're sometimes uh, backing out at the last minute because they decided that they want to stay with their current job or they have uh, got a better offer so um, we actually lost uh, three individuals that were all but ready to come here um, and had already signed a commitment letter and then backed out at the last minute and then um, this happened. So um, that's just some of the difficulties we've had. Uh, we lost an engineer um, because he wanted to go have other life experiences, no fault to him, um, but it just kind of been, some of it just was bad timing. Um, and then the other part of it is just, um, having a hard time being able to fill some of these positions. Well, I just want to add my um, two cents here that I am so grateful for the work that you all do and want to recognize that you've um, done a lot with a little and uh, we're, I, I, and I think that shows um, through this as well. Um, I know there are folks have things I want to say. Um, did I see it? I, I know I saw a hand from Dan and then Connor. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and then Jay. Um, so when we when you talk about the the goals for each year, the approximate goal and target for each of these categories, like resurfacing or leveling two miles of, of road, um, is that a function of of both staff and budget? Um, such that if you were fully staffed, would you have been able to have done more um, paving this year? Or was it because the, the budget numbers were held back? So uh, in terms of paving, that was is directly related to the budget being held back. Um, that is something that we contract out that service. Um, so when we eliminate roads like Westwood, uh, that was you know almost three quarters of a mile. Um, so we ended up having to take things out to meet um, the shortfalls in the budget, which is why we weren't able to hit those targets. Right. And, and so if a budget uh, shortfall is coming in the upcoming year, it just means again, further delays in that. And the only way to sort of get either caught up or um, back on track would be uh, to expand the budget to allow for that missing pieces. Yes. But, um, and, and let me ask that question then about catching up with some of these goals and plans, some of these larger goals and plans, you know, is this something where these are just lost years and we're going to have to reevaluate these plans um, in the near future? Or do you see a path forward uh, for catching up with some of these larger goals? 
Um, so sh I guess street paving is probably the hardest one to, to talk about um, because um, it relies really so much on hitting your minimum targets. Uh, I mean, generally we have uh, 40 miles of road at, that we pave and we have a 20 year life cycle. So it's pretty easy to understand that you need to do two, two miles a year um, to be able to get your 40 miles. Um, so when you, when you start, when you are unable to do as much, um, we can only get really so creative with how you, ex you know, stretch the money. Um, you know, coming straight this year, we were going to convert to gravel um, in an effort to kind of improve the road. Um, so I think that we will be able to catch up a little bit, but without really um, increasing the funding, I don't know how we can have a, I don't know if we'll ever be able to, to truly catch up, um, at least in, in the like short term. Um, it may be a little bit of a pr progression to dig us back out of it. Sure. But even looking beyond the uh, the paving question, as far as, uh, for example, um, the master plan for the water and sewer um, that you mentioned, you know, is this something where um, you're going to be looking to reevaluate some of that in the next in the next two years? Um, or do you see a path forward to catching up with some of these? Yeah, so for the water and sewer master plans, um, we, we had planned to essentially reevaluate those on a five year cycle. It's just a lot of changes with the plants and everything, like I mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> we don't know where those funds are exactly yet as far as financial impacts. Well, there's some early indication that there's some delinquent um, you know, water sewer bills, um, but we don't uh, have a good handle at this point on what the financial impacts are. Um, you know, the, in the short term, I don't think, um, you know, the loss of, of the CIP for paving um, funds associated with large reconstruction projects, I think we could catch up from that and just do solely utility projects if the funding's there. But um, I think at this point, it's a little, little too early for us to, to say exactly what that impact's going to be. But I, but I think there's still a chance we could, um, you know, stay on track with the city state. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah thank you, uh, Connor. Yeah. No. I th I think I just wanted to echo the thanks of everybody else. It's um actually pretty exceptional when you see this report. We, we've deferred half a million dollars. You're down six staff. We've asked you to like reduce overtime. Um, sometimes I think like if we just push pause this whole last year, you know, we're doing okay. So to see the progress that's been made, um, I, I think is pretty remarkable. And uh, just hope you're honest with us going forward about what you can and you can't do, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, this is great. And, and the other thing, like, um, it's not insignificant, this parking change that we've gone through the last few days. And to see the emails of, you know, constituents who feel like they've been heard, uh, and what might be a minor change, but it is a very major thing for them. Um, really appreciate that, guys. Um, I, I think you've all had a really good way about you as you interact with people in the city there. Um, but let us know the limitations, and we'll probably have to reconcile the overtime and uh, sort of a staff shortage as we get into the, the budget there. But thanks so much. Yeah, I just want to add, too, I mean, they have done a great job. And you know, when you add up everything, water, sewer, all of it, DPW really is about 50% of all the money we spent. I mean, half of everything the city does comes from, from them. And so, of course, what that means is when you have big financial problems, they, they get the biggest hits, um, in part because some of their projects are the biggest dollars. And, you know, I, 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 we, have our, we actually have our budget Congress tomorrow, but I suspect It'll be more of the same, at least for one more year. You know, someone someone asked, "Are we just do? Is this just a two lost years?" In some regards, that's kind of the, the way it is, um, at least in terms of major projects. I think what we I don't, staff in after we get through this year needs to think about is as we come out of this, is there a way to, you know, bundle a bunch of projects uh, and maybe do a five year bond or something to to play some catch up for for the lost years and still try to stay within our annual funding, but 
you know, front load some projects, but I, you know, we'll get time to think about that. But, you know, none of, none of us saw this coming and it's, you know, some of even some of the water and sewer things they do is with their own people. And if they're short people and people can't work in close proximity and, uh, you know, so hats off, uh, DPW has just been fa fabulous and very responsive to people. And uh, so, yeah, tough, tough time right now for them. Yeah, I agree. So, so grateful. Um, I just have a couple of, of follow-up uh, questions for you. Um, I, I uh, see that Taylor Street is in the completed category. Um, I know it's uh, upon occasion over over the summer, you know, they would do work and then sort of fill it back in. Um, but so it's so Taylor Street is is done now. Yeah, with the exception of the lighting, the lighting posts still need to go up. So, okay. um, the the bases are in; they're ready. Where I think we're just waiting on the electrical contractor to, to get in here. And there was some uh, there was a really long lead time in the actual fixture um, that they had a problem securing. And again, it goes back to COVID COVID related issues. They couldn't the supplier couldn't. They couldn't get the light that they needed uh, that we had that was spec. So there were some some lengthy issues. But I I'd have to ask Corey about when they're going to be here. But I, I think it's fairly shortly. Okay. That's good to know. And it's also good to know um, just a little bit of the backstory about the Moat property. I mean, that's something that folks had been you know upon occasion asking me about, and and you know wasn't sure what the status was or or why there were some delays there. But but it's good to know and. Uh, you know, hopefully they're able to find the folks they need uh, to get that done. Um, you know, just coming to uh, sort of what Dan was saying and, and Bill were saying earlier, I mean, I, um, you know, just thinking about the gap that this generates on into the future. And it's so, I mean, as with everything, it's just so hard to know how it's going to play out. I mean, I, I like this idea of having a bond to bundle a bunch of work together so that we can potentially catch up. Uh, but I, I could also see um, us, you know, I mean, at, at one point, you know, while I was still on council, we were, we were quite far behind on fully funding our, our infrastructure needs. And those were, <laughs> I mean, they were not good times for everyone, but, uh, you know, relatively speaking, they were better times. And uh, so I, I could just also picture us making a commitment in the future to, uh, to catching up and, uh, you know, acknowledging that, like, if, if we're going to stay on top of this so that our roads don't fall into such disrepair that, that they're even more expensive to get, get back up to, to speed, that that's, um, an, an investment worth making. Um, it's anyway, that's going to be a conversation for a future council, I think. Um, you know, especially as we come to understand like what our, I mean, yeah, what, what's normal for our income and um, expenditures moving forward because nothing, nothing is normal yet. <laughs> Um, but regardless, um, so grateful for all of the work that you all are doing and, um, you know, this continues to be, uh, hard conversations about, about the budget stuff. And, but, you know, we are, um, so grateful for all the, the work that you've done. So thank you. Cool. Any other further comments? Oh, yes, uh, Jay. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, Jay. It's it's all right, and and I won't be redundant because uh, I I too am thankful for all the work, but I just think it's important also to acknowledge that that the report you guys um, you all have just presented are are some of the more macro goals and and projects that you're looking at as a city, but um, I I just think it's really important to acknowledge all the kind of the micro and the small issues that you deal with on a daily basis, whether it's you know an emergency water main break. It's 10 inches of snow in the first week of November. 
it's issues that come up for individual um, households um, that you know you're still dealing with on a daily basis and doing your best to to communicate with with um, you know with with folks who live in the city and and stay on top of it to um, to resolve issues as quickly as possible. Um, I just I just think that that's important to, to acknowledge too that those things never stop. Uh, regardless of where the budget's at and and how many feet you've paved or cracks you filled or or et cetera. So I just wanted to uh, thank you all again for for staying on top of that and and your diligence with uh, with those things. Thanks again. Yeah, agreed. Mayor Steve Whitaker, when you get a minute, I'd like to comment on this topic. Uh, I think now would be a, a good time. Go ahead, Stephen. So, again, with with uh, respect and admiration for the effort and the teamwork that goes into this, I think this is a budget category which has been uh, short shorted in pr in prior years for many years running, even possibly decades. And I think we're foolish to not fund find the money somewhere to get the survey and have shovel ready projects when federal. Uh, stimulus money starts to flow. We should be doing that survey now uh, on numerous projects. But to say that we're maintaining steady state, that's a slow slide backward. I mean, you've been hearing from me for years over these crosswalks, the paving that was done improperly last time, the puddling in the crosswalks, which freezes. And we haven't fixed that year after year after year. And, and it's, it's unconscionable. So when we have sloped sidewalks from Frost Eve on School Street where people are falling down just trying to walk down the sidewalk because the library melt runs across the sidewalk and freezes. And and it's, you can't walk on a sloped sidewalk. And it's just, there's, there's too much that's getting neglected, you know, and it's not that people are staying home and noticing this. I've been noticing this and, and listing it for way too long. And my point is that we need, this COVID has come and created a perfect storm to lower our bar of expectations. And that's not what we should be doing. We should be raising our bar of expectations and hiring the people to get the job done and get caught up on a decade or two of, of neglected maintenance. So it, you, you need to put more funding in, but it's, it's a try, we spent a quarter million dollars on signs that do nothing, that point to post businesses when we could have actually, you know, fixed some sidewalk or, or, you know, replaced the two lampposts would have live electric wires hanging out on uh, the school street bridge or the Rose Lucia bridge and right in front of uh, the, the fire station. I mean, we're, the, the snow plow hits and pries up the steel on the Rose Lucia bridge. All those corners are bent up and curled. And I've walked around and show those, you know, to staff. And we don't have time to walk around with a, a sledgehammer and pound that back down. We don't have time to fix the most glaring, you know. Anyway, you got the point. Donna's definitely got my got the point. Um, this now would be the time. We know federal stimulus money is coming. Now would be the time to get ready for it. Instead of worrying about a five-year bond, let's get some projects teed up and find the right staffing and get the survey work done now. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Stephen. Um, anyone else? Constantinos is raising his hand. Great. Uh, Constantinos, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, Donna and Zach and Kurt for their presentation. It was really informative and the rest of the DPW staff for all the work that they've been doing this year. Uh, especially given all these circumstances, the budget cuts, the furloughs, everything else, I think you know, DPW is really the heroes of the city, keeping everything moving. I mean, getting up at, or getting the roads um, clean at 4 a.m. this morning from uh, the snow and all the other jobs that you're going to be doing this winter season, and uh, you know the water main breaks are happening, and I think it's great uh, all the work that DPW does. That it, but I just like to echo what. Um, the mayor and Zach had alluded to, and, and what Stephen had just said about this deferred maintenance uh, being an issue that, you know, if we do go through this austerity measures going forward and DPW does get cut, it might actually be more expensive um, 
to cut now to and then fix later. So I would hope that during the, your budget deliberations going forward that um, I'd hope that you try and fully fund DPW as much as possible given the circumstances. And uh, to me, uh, and, and again, I'm speaking as myself now, not as a member of MTAKER. Um, you know, I think any dollar that goes to DPW is a dollar well spent towards the welfare of our community. Uh, and I hope that, you know, you take that to heart when you're putting your budget together. Thank, Thank you. you. Great, any other thoughts on this? Okay. All right. So um, we are going to um, move on. Now, I had earlier in the, in the meeting said that we would um, table the Girton uh, park, uh, park discussion. Um, but I, uh, so, and Paige was not able to join us, obviously. Um, Connor, do you have any further word on that? I, I think I was texting with her right now. She, she would be grateful, I think, for another couple of weeks to maybe discuss this and come back with uh, some more concrete stuff. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, committee still, I think. Okay. Well, let's put it early on the agenda um, <laughs> for next time. How does that sound? Okay. Unless there's... No, you just have a lot next meeting. Oh. Hmm. We're supposed to be presenting the budget. GMT is coming to talk about microtransit. Um, we were going to hear from Capital Fire Mutual Aid about their uh, their dispatch of communications infrastructure, um, and then I think those are the three big things. And uh, Mike Mike was going to do um, an update on the housing initiatives goal. Uh, we could probably push that to the ninth. And do Curtin Park on the twelfth, or do Curtin Park on the ninth. The ninth is all budget. We don't have anything else. Okay. So maybe the mayor and I can talk about scheduling. Okay. Which which meeting would be best? Okay. For we'll figure that out. I do think just it is a reality check, though, um, and I'm saying this without having talked to our DPW folks or our parks folks or anything. We, we could be reaching a point in time where moving the park, moving that structure, it won't be happening until spring. So, uh, it, you know, there's, there's, that's just one of the consequences of if we, if we, if we were to move it, if we, the desire was to move it, and we chose to do so, we, depending on the weather and conditions and where it's going, that could be an issue. You know, I had wondered whether or not that was already the case. Um, Depending on what we do with it, I don't know that it is, but it could be soon. I, but you, I, say that, I say that without having talked to our folks that actually know what they're talking about. So, yeah. <laughs> so really disregard what I just said. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of my questions. All we need is a real snow melt freeze and you can't move it. So I'm glad you're thinking about that. But I also feel like we have an issue now that we're not really dealing with. And trying to word this well, I think of having two sons. They're now in their 50s, so they live through it. But you have two very clear different demands for that shared youth path. And some of the people using it feel very much harassed and intimidated by people who are using that particular shelter. And I, I want to balance both needs. So how do we do that? I mean, how is the, the police or social worker who we now have in place someone to help us uh, negotiate behavior so that people can both have their rights totally protected but we both need to be respectful while we protect one another's rights. So I'm really looking for some action now to move in that direction, whether or not that particular structure stays in place. So I'd like to have, whether it's a conversation now or, or asking the police and DPW and all to talk among themselves, how to keep it clean and how to keep behavior friendly on, on everybody's side. Does that make sense at all? 
So I'll, I'll just weigh in without, I mean, we can, we will certainly be happy to have that conversation. You know, I, I think asking city staff from any department to, to keep behave, to keep a, a certain behavior at a certain location at a certain standard at all times um, is unrealistic. I don't think, I don't think, you know, we can't be there all the time. Um, and, you know, so I think one, one of the things in the, the, the look at where at an alternative location, if that's what you wanted to do, we try to consider how do we put this in, in a place that still meets the needs of the people that want to congregate there and, and is all, but it is also still accessible to the public since it was put, you know, meant to be a public amenity. And, and I mean, all, all members of the public um, and uh, potentially have it relate to the bike path, although not necessarily. And, um, you know, I, and again, I, I think from our perspective, my perspective, I'll just I'll speak solely for myself at this point, you know, this particular location on that corner with fences on either side and then the bridge just creates a cornered in situation. Now, every, not everyone has to agree with that, that's fine. Um, but I do think, you know, having it somewhere central in the community where people who are using it can still easily get to it is, is important. But it, I, I think, Donna, you're right. It's creating a conflict between two public facilities that were intended for different uses that are, are in conflict with one another. Well, but it's back to the same conflict you were having with people uh, on the sidewalks on State Street when they were in front of stores, but not in front of storeways. It's like how to share that space. And I feel like we've got so tied up into moving the structure that we're missing the more significant conversation that I was hoping the social worker, the peer support counselor was going to help us and our neighbors learn how to talk to one another and share this space. And I, I'm not expecting the police or anyone else to be there every time, but somehow to have us have some really active group conversations so that we can work on this, whatever happens to this shelter. It's still an issue of shared public space. Absolutely. So I'm feeling a little torn at this point. I know we've, we've said we would, um, uh, push this off to another uh, day, um, though, you know, it's, I guess it's, it is 940, and I'm not sure that we would be able to wrap this up by 10 exactly, but how do others feel about having a discussion about this presently? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I feel comfortable having a discussion now. I, you know, I reviewed the options, and, you know, I think there's, there's a couple of different conversations within this and it's part of it is keeping those threads somewhat separate and I think Donna's point's a fair one um, but I think I, I think that her point is is a larger point and I think you know the worst of all worlds is a situation where you have a shared use that creates an antagonistic situation which from the feedback that I've gotten in the past few weeks from people feels like it's 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 moving in that direction um one of the things i was really impressed about in looking at different options about where to put this that preserved the essential uses and i think that i felt last time we discussed this it was really about how do we how do we preserve the essential use of the bike path um and this this use and this need that has sort of um sua sponte kind of arisen around this shelter um, where it is. Um, and one of the options, you know, would be to move the shelter to where in front of City Hall, where the uh, sort of plexiglass bus shelter is. Um, and one of the things that I really liked, I talked about, talked with Bill about this, is because it would be so close to a building, it would put in, it would, it would enable a charging station potentially to be connected to the shelter so that if anyone, you know, because I know that's that's one of those issues where people need um, a place to charge cell phones if they can't have access in, to inside of a building. And so if this shelter had that, in, in some ways that feels like it, it resolves a number of these issues. Uh, one is <clears throat> it, it stops making the use that's emerged for the shelter 
and the use for the bike path stop being antagonistic to each other. Um, secondly, it preserves that use um, of the shelter, but in a in and in a similar downtown centralized location. And and fourth, it augments that use. It allows for something that doesn't exist right now. Um, and so, you know, that to me, it, it, finding a solution like that, I, I mean, that's just sort of a gift when you can make something like that work like that, because then I think you can also <clears throat> then address what Don is talking about and some of those larger questions, because you, you've backed each other, backed the two uses off, and then it becomes much easier to talk about, um, you know, what these uses look like, how people, um, how people relate to each other, and, and some of these problems. Um, you know, such as such as we've seen in the past, and such as we've seen at this site, when when they're when they're forced into sort of each other's faces, I think you encourage that antagonistic behavior. I mean, you you get emails from panicked constituents who say, "I'm really uncomfortable walking by this," or uh, an email, "Hey, there's there's naked people down at the shelter that you know are causing some people to, um, uh, you know, say why why aren't we solving this problem?" Um, and not the bigger problem, but the small acute problem. Um, and so I think by backing this off, and so to me, we, we, could, we could hold this conversation off because to go back to the mayor's pending question, which is, you know, I, I think we could put this off. We could put this off for two weeks, three weeks. We could talk to, to Paige. Um, you know, we could sort of mull this over a little bit, but this, is, this seems like a fairly clear solution that Keeping it where it is right now is not a workable solution because I think it does a disservice to both uses um, and encourages the antagonism that we've seen over the summer. Um, and finding, and you know, because we have these other options, and I can understand a few weeks ago when we, we didn't have an option where there wasn't, where there was a, a, an asserted use, but not necessarily an option on the table. Um, but I feel like now we have that and we have that option. And so I'm happy to go ahead and have the conversation. Hell, I'm happy to vote for it right now. Uh, Jack, go ahead. One of the concerns I have is that uh, <clears throat> I suspect that there are people who were watching the meeting earlier who heard the mayor say, yeah, let's table it, let's push, push it off to another meeting. And I actually, while the meeting's been going on, talked to a couple of people who are interested and they said, so is it not happening tonight? And I said, yeah, it looks like it's not happening tonight. Um, and I think we're depriving ourselves of the public input that we uh, were hoping to get. Um, I, whether, the, uh, whether the location in front of City Hall is is a good option or not i think that's certainly something that uh is a good part of the conversation although i don't think it's realistic to say that uh people who are uncomfortable walking past uh this structure with people congregating on them on it on the uh, shared use path are going to be any more comfortable walking past it when they're, when that site of congregation is right in front of City Hall. So I don't think it's an easy discussion. So I, I am certainly kicking myself for just like straight up canceling it earlier. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I probably should not have just jumped to that. Um, but I think you're right that we, probably do need to make this decision with, um, you know, if there, if there are people that want to weigh in, we need to hear from them. Um, and I, I also have faith that, you know, there might be, there might be some warm days um, left or warm enough days left that it possibly could still be moved, even if we take it up um, later. But Lauren, go ahead. Well, I guess I was just wondering if, um, I, I don't think I do, but are there, were there questions or like with a memo we got, is there any 
additional information gathering that it would be good to let city staff know or anything if we're going to push it off two weeks so that we don't have the discussion and then realize oh wait i had this question and we didn't answer it in the meantime uh connor go ahead yeah i can see uh i thought maybe confluence park might be an option too if it was set back far enough and there was talk of having a, a structure such as this I, I think at some point with the river conservancy um, so that was the only question I had. I'll tell you, like the constituents I've heard from um, this week have said, leave it there. You know, we want to keep it on the bike path. It's, uh, you know, the, the, whatever problems you have are going to move with the structure. Uh, so just deal with that. And there's like a thinner spots on the bike path that would create, you know, just as much problem with the social distancing and stuff. Um, in talking to the page, and it was, you know, it was, it was a brief conversation, but it was definitely meaningful to her. Um, given the work that Jed has done on sort of water quality in town, to maybe have that on a place on the water where the grandkids could come by and uh, sort of pay tribute to the granddad there. So if there are options like that, I don't mean to get too sentimental, but that would definitely resonate with me. So uh, just for context also, I, um, I'm i a little wary of putting it, uh, I've, I've thought about putting on the, uh, you know, the option of putting it at the Confluence Park space as well, but uh, it seems as though that may actually not resolve the issue um, uh, too much because there is still that proximity and there's there's still a, a corner there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm gonna let Jay go, go ahead. And then um, Steven, go ahead. Well, I'll just, jump in on a couple thoughts here one is the um the i think the as far as the confluence park as i understand it you know there's there's been a fair amount of design work already done and a structure like this there is you know thought of kind of an open space or a performance space but a structure like this doesn't necessarily fit in to to what the you know where the design is at at this point and um and yeah i would be concerned that it would not alleviate um, uh, the issues that are, that are happening right now. Um, beyond that, an, another, another thought, um, would be to, um, well, I, I yeah, I, I guess I don't want to necessarily introduce another, another potential location because I think we've got to sort of decide if, if we're, 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 we, we're at a place where we can talk about moving it or I guess my, my primary concern is, as Dan said, that there, there's a real conflict happening of uh, use conflict happening where it's at now so are we in a place where we could say we we can move it um to resolve that conflict because where it is now isn't working um or are we in a because it doesn't seem like we're in a place now where we can figure out exactly where it needs to be um in the long term so those are just just a couple thoughts so um uh, yes cameron I just also wanted to acknowledge that um, while I do think that the, the Homelessness Task Force did talk about this, um, y'all asked them to, and they did have a pretty long conversation about this. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of check in on if you're going to be talking later, how you would like to receive that information. Um, they did not have a cohesive statement, and they were also, um, they wanted me to share their thoughts. And also, they really were torn um, voting-wise over whether or not to um, ask you for more time to consider your ask. So I just wanted to let you know that. I could also write it in a memo, if that helps. Hmm, that's interesting. That's that's good to know. Um, uh, Stephen, you wanted to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I think the uh, the inconvenience or the uh, anxiety that other bike path users feel is is minuscule in compared to the feeling of the people who use utilize that space as their only place where they can have a little shelter from the rain or from the wind who don't have shelter otherwise that's located within uh, proximity to where they can go and crap on the riverbank or pee in the bushes that will not exist in at city hall uh, there, I mean, it's clear that public drinking, you know, open container violations happen there, but 
that will not be uh, as easily, uh, you know, City Hall. There's a privacy dimension of the human needs that are not being met that are coming home to roost here. Uh, the, the, the toilet facilities, the privacy, the respect, the dignity, the et cetera. And, and it will not be solved by just taking it away from them, uh, taking it away from them. Morgan had uh, comments in the Homelessness Task Force this morning. It, it's like it's not in my backyard was one, it, the NIMBY acronym, you know, and he characterized it as, no, not on planet Earth. We don't want these people near us, you know? And I think he, he, he's voicing something that you need to hear, that this is a, this problem will not be solved by taking away the only safe structure they have to use right now. Uh, true, they wouldn't have to pee in the pocket park if there was a bathroom, if they could go and use the transit center bathrooms. But no, we just gave away that that option. So I, the task force ran out of time. Several key members, uh, Will Everly and Ted uh, Russell, needed to leave today. The discussion could have easily gone on another hour even. So, but ironically, uh, a vote to ask for more time failed uh, because of politics. So I just think you're, you're, you're not going to be able to solve this problem. You can take something away. Uh, you can move it somewhere else. You can move it somewhere better or worse for the population it serves. But you know that Casey and others have slept there. You won't be able to sleep next to the Walgreens driveway, you know? Uh, anyway, it's, it's a very complex issue, and if we do handle it right, we will make huge progress on not long-neglected issues of responsibility and dignity and human rights that exist in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Paige, yes, welcome. Hi, hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry to jump in late. I was told earlier that you were going to table this until next week, so I was well, so dead, and I got a note from John Odom saying, uh, you better. <laughs> yeah, we we were, and then we, you know, we were like, well, should we should we table it, and then and then of course that just became discussion. But um, uh, go ahead, Paige. Well, tell us. I've, I've talked with both you. I talked with Connor this afternoon. I appreciate your getting in touch with me. Um, and I, I honestly think that this is a way bigger problem than just the the uh, Girton Park. Um, that moving the shelter is not going to solve the problem. And it does, as Stephen said, it takes away, right now, everything is closed to those people. City Hall is closed. The churches are closed. The transit center is closed. Everything is closed that they could normally go to. And that's a place with shelter. Um, I, granted, it's not convenient for the rest of us, but I think taking it away does a disservice to the community. The other thing is, it that structure and the flowers and whatever, when they're kept up, um, beautifies a particularly ugly spot on the bike path. So I think you really need to think for, I don't know where you're at right now. If you're gonna move it to City Hall, I'm gonna protest violently. I think that's really uh, unproductive, totally unproductive move. Maybe I misunderstood, I just got here. So um, anyway, I, um, I talked with my son tonight, actually, for a while, and I, I had, as I mentioned to Anne, I had a couple of suggestions, and I wouldn't do it now. I would do it after COVID is done, and maybe people have places to go, or after we have a discussion about what else we can possibly provide for people who don't want to live in houses. Um, but one of the places was the Future Confluence Park. I think that might produce the same problem because it's not very far away and it's also difficult to access to clean and empty the trash and I don't know that there's water available there. The other possibility is um, along Old Country Club Road, there's a little parking lot, there's a fishing spot, that's a long stretch of bike path without any shelter from the sun or the rain or whatever. 
It's a really nice area. It's far enough so that some of the local people might not go all the way, you know, some of the homeless might not go all the way out there. You could set up um, a little solar pump with water from the um, river to water flowers and beautify it and make it a really nice spot out there. And personally, because it's for Jed, or that was after the fact, I realized that, but it is now a memorial. I would love to see it on the river. I think that's important. I think that's what he was about. But I also believe that he would not be happy about just taking that little shelter away from the people who are using it. So um, one other, thank you. Um, so one other piece of information that feels relevant is that um, from my communications with another way, they were planning on building um, uh, a similar structure on their site. So whatever function um, the, that structure is serving uh, could potentially be um, replicated over there, which is not that far. Um, right, but it's also right on the bike path. So that right. the problem is not going to be eliminated unless you move it away a little bit. Right. Well, and so that's, uh, I guess I'm, um, I'm saying that uh, that frees up the location of uh, the, right. Um, right. the, the structure. Right. That's great. I'm really happy to hear that um, yeah, yeah. because I think something something needs to be provided for people and everything else is close to them right now because of COVID. Yeah. So that would be awesome. Mm. Well, so I d it is 10 o'clock. I actually don't think it would, because we said we would table it, I don't think it would really necessarily be appropriate for us to vote on it tonight, unfortunately. Um, but uh, which is actually like what I was like hoping to avoid. <laughs> but um, Morgan, you wanted to add something. Go ahead, Morgan. Yes. Um, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Uh, first off, I just want to thank Stephen for his comments and uh, and uh, quoting me accurately and uh, from today. And I also want to thank Paige for. Um, getting on and chiming in. I appreciate your comments. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm quite concerned about, you know, this, this had been tabled and now the discussion has been backdoored, which, you know, it's up to the council's discretion. I know that's why I have been watching you on YouTube. I know how these things can happen. So I've alerted all kinds of people uh about this you know i had let them know earlier that got tabled and i've since alerted them that oh guess what they're discussing it now and you know it it disturbs me you know that uh it's being raised even though you might not vote on it it's being raised and discussed in, in quite length after a lot of people have you know probably uh turned you off and gone and done other things and not paying attention. And, you know, it's like, if you're going to have a discussion, forget a vote. If you're going to have a discussion on it, you know, have it when, you know, people are going to pay attention like they were earlier because they thought it was on the agenda, you know, and uh, this is not all right, you know, and I was upset about this whole thing anyway before. And, and now, you know, I'll probably be up half tonight. You know, this is this is not okay. And um, you know, have an honest discussion. Don't want people are listening. You know, and trying to move this structure, you're kicking the people living homeless that are using it down the road. And you know, this is not NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's nope not on planet earth and you know it's it's not all right you know people living homeless they're just as important as anybody else and you know their needs are great you know and we should be discussing what the root root situation is you know what the root problem what the root need is and that's we need housing you know, let's do something real meaningful. You know, quit kicking this down the road. You know, 
quit trying to get rid of these people because that's what you're doing, you know. And, hey, you have the right to discuss it, but let's do it in the open, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Morgan. I, I appreciate that. And I um, I think it is, I agree. Uh, and I, I think it's important that, uh, that we hear from everybody. And so uh, we're going to wait at least until the next meeting to um, make any final decisions. But, thank you know, you. That, yeah, that's, I, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, in any case, all right. Um, <laughs> one hopes that, like, we're like getting closer <laughs> to making a decision, but, um, but we'll see. All right, any further final comments on this as we're probably not gonna vote tonight? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and uh, so on to uh, uh, council reports. Uh, Donna, are you? Are you good to go? Checking. You have other business listed before council reports. Do you want to well, ask anybody? I yeah. I mean, is there any other business? <laughs> usually, I mean, there's usually other business listed, and there usually isn't any. Um, but uh, yeah, it also lists the mayor's report first this week, which I well, there you go. Go for it, Anne. <laughs> no. Well, in that case, I actually don't have anything to add, so I would pass. <laughs> go ahead, Donna. You always make me want to be brief. Um, the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority had two new appointments by the City of Barrie that will be joining that board. Its next meeting is December 10th and will be meeting to review the submittals to the RFP. Keep you posted. Uh, the other thing that I would like to talk at length at some point, maybe when we have a less late meeting, is Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission has become the designated service provider for the Winooski Basin. And all the funding from the state, their clean water funding, instead of going to the state directly and do a grant, you'll go to this service provider. So they will allocate the funding, they'll oversee the projects. And so it's a big change in <clears throat> the, how things flow or dealing with clean water. And so there's a lot I'd like to share about that at some point. And third, I'd like to check with Jack to see if he got all the council members to give blood on the 13th. I did. <laughs> That's all. Want me to answer it now? The answer is no. There's There are at least two members of the council who were, uh, who for medical reasons, are not able to, uh, to do it. I, I tried it with uh, my office, too, and uh, I got... Uh, I, I got some response, but not everybody. But uh, you know, I, I've been giving blood for uh, well, almost 50 years. And I'm going to keep doing it, and I think the rest of us who do uh, will continue to do it when we can. I'm glad you nudged us all. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Connor. Um, no, I think I've got uh, just a, a very happy Thanksgiving to everybody next week. I'm I saw a meme today, which I thought was kind of smart. It's uh, a Zoom Thanksgiving with your family is preferable to an ICU Christmas there. So just hope everybody is really smart, you know. Um, good news on the vaccine, right? So let's all just hang in there. Thanks so much. Thanks. Um, Jay. Yeah, Paul. Uh, echo Connor's uh, thought around making sure we're safe making smart choices um, uh, around Thanksgiving. Um, make sure everybody, uh, if, if you're down uh, near Shaw's, uh, the new downtown Montpelier sign went in today, if you've seen it. Um, it's uh, pretty striking. Um, and uh, just, I, I think it, it, it kind of, I could say this at every meeting, but it goes without saying, um, a, a thank you to uh, our school district, the administrators, teachers, and staff for everything they're doing. The fact that our, we're, we're able to, even with everything that's happening, our, our kids are still in school and, and having real positive experiences. I just think that that's um, uh, been a Herculean effort. So I just wanted to acknowledge that once again. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Dan. 
Picking up on Jay's comment, I, I don't know if everyone's having good experiences. My 11 year old has some grievances, but those have, may, may have more to do with long division than anything else. Um, first, I, I want to uh, take a moment in the report to pay tribute to um, one of the uh, volunteers that keep Montpelier going who passed away last week, Mary Nielsen, um, who some of you may or may not know who was chair of the Greenmount Cemetery Commission for a number of years and active member in uh, the Montpelier community passed away. Um, when I was on the, when I was the cemetery commissioner, she was chair uh, and it was just an absolute pleasure to work with her each and every meeting. Um, a really wonderful, friendly, caring, giving person. Um, she and Corky uh, were great to spend time and, and talk with and you know, it's people like Mary who make Montpelier a wonderful place to live and who, you know, show that service is, is not a drudge or a burden or something that we have to um, just do as our duty. It's, it's a joy and a pleasure. And uh, she brought that to her work here. And so, you know, I think we're a, a smaller city as a result of her passing. And uh, I just want to recognize her. Um, the other thing is that I would encourage everyone who has any uh, funds available to make sure that you spend them downtown at our businesses to make sure that they do go into the black between now and the end of the year. Um, more that you can spend locally, uh, the more that stays locally. Well, one thing I, I have done work on, on uh, some economic impacts of local studies, uh, I mean of local spending. And when you spend money in the community, it's not like spending a dollar it's like spending up to six dollars because that dollar bounces around the local community um, and has impacts well beyond that single purchase of a whoopee cushion at uh, Woodbury Mountain Toys. Um, it spends uh, and allows other people to uh, in keep their standard of living, keep their business, keep their independence, and keep uh, living in this wonderful community. So uh, I think those are the two notes that I'll add. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jack. I guess I'll have to keep an eye open for the whoopee cushions. I didn't realize they had them there. Uh, <laughs> as much time as I've spent there. Um, I, I, I'll pass. Um, Lauren. Yeah, um, just wanted to let you all know the um, Police Review Committee met last night. So we're getting up and running and organized. Um, so uh, great to get that group together. And we're mostly focused uh, in the short term on the membership. So hopefully we'll be getting back to you all soon uh, with that. Um, and I just wanted to raise, I know there were some emails going around about the homeless shelter and issues. So I don't know if that needs to be on the next city agenda or what what we're doing sounds like some um you know problematic issues going on with a shelter and and capacity so just wanted to put that on our on our list to look into um wanted to confess i was one of the people that did not give blood but it's a moment to say thank you to many of the city staff who when i passed out when i gave blood in october and bill kindly gave me a ride home because i was <laughs> I didn't react well to to my recent one, so thank you to the city staff who took good care of me. <laughs> in I that, really you. your secret was safe with me. <laughs> but um, but appreciate everybody who who did give blood and um, good old Mary Mello was there. She was like, I volunteer now, standing at the desk instead. I was like, that makes better sense for me. Um, but stay safe, everyone. Follow the 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 rules that our state's putting out. They're there for a reason and happy Thanksgiving. Great, thank you. John. I'm here, I'm here. Sorry, I always press the wrong button. Um, uh, I would just mention a couple things. Um, uh, one of them is very short and one of them I'll keep very short. Uh, just that I am still away, um, been away for a bit and it's sort of turned into a, uh, an actual quarantine and I need to wait for test results because I may have had exposure. So blah, 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 blah. Um, but then I should be back. If I'm lucky, I'll be back Friday, but I'll probably be back Monday. And Crystal has been out this week too. She fell ill. 
which means the two person operation is now a zero person operation. So I know there are some frustrated people out there that neither of us are available, but it was just not foreseeable, unfortunately. Um, another thing I just want to sort of put in people's minds, um, already looking ahead to the town meeting day election, um, there, if the expectation is now out there that all our, especially during COVID, that all our elections are going to be vote by mail, um, the money that facilitated this from the Secretary of State is apparently not available for municipal elections. There has to be something you know, statewide or federal on it. So I have so far failed and I'm about to give up on trying to find grants elsewhere. So I got a recent grant to buy all the plexiglass and stuff we used in the last election. So there may be more grants out there to allow us to do it again, just on our own, just, you know, got a sort of a budget out there, see if we can do the all mail thing ourselves, but that's looking unlikely. So um, anyways, any ideas on that? There's probably no ideas to be had, but um, people should probably start preparing across the state in all municipalities for stepping back a bit and having an election more like the August primary rather than the general election, which unfortunately is going to be a lot more labor intensive. <laughs> Since we're talking about that, I do want to just point out that it might be worth us um, considering uh, adding some funds to the budget specifically for this. Um, we may not have funding to do, um, you know, mail-in voting for this coming town meeting day, but we can plan for future town meeting days. Um, so I just want to put that on people's radars. For, for less than $10,000, that may be worth it. Um, Connor. Yeah, John, John, I had a question that came up uh, this past week. Um, if folks want to petition something onto the ballot for town meeting day, is there any alternative to getting physical signatures that like maybe they pass in the legislature, just like candidates were given, you know, the opportunity? You know, um, it's this, I hate to, to, to put this in a, a, such a holding pattern, but we haven't gotten guidance from the Secretary of State yet on this. We're all a little, a little confused as to where that's going to go and to whether that, you know, before the signature requirements were sustained, Suspended, which of course made it easy for that huge list of presidential candidates, right? Um, so we don't know what it's going to be. And I've been asked, I mean, I was asked about this as far back as nearly two months. So I tried to put out to people who've asked me, you know, there may be ways around it. If you're just running for office, you know, you can always get people, you need 25 signatures, 25 people to download a form all by itself, write it and put it in the mail. Uh, petitions are more complicated. Um, I, the only good answer I came up with, and I'm guessing the Secretary of State will, will cut some slack on this, but given that they haven't yet, given that we don't know, is um, it may be possible to hold a couple like social distance petition fairs. You know, maybe we get a big space like the auditorium and set out tables. Everybody's got a petition for anything. And you can come up at a distance with masks on and go and sign what you want. Um, I, I'm sort of grasping at straws, but that's all I got right now. It's interesting. Uh, Jack, go ahead. I, uh, I have an answer to that. Uh, I, uh, have also been caught like Connor. I've been contacted by a constituent asking about petitioning. And so I contacted the, um, secretary of state's office, the elections division. This is what I was calling you about today, John. Um, they say something to you? Yes, they yeah. tell me. <laughs> well, um, with regard to petitions for uh, public office, um, this past fall they passed a bill before they recessed removing the signature requirement for petitions for local office, and that was uh, Section One A Two of S Three Fifty Four, and. They did not uh, remove this uh, petition requirement for petitioned articles, including social service appropriations. Uh, the League of Cities and Towns has a guidance on model, model policies that towns can, uh, can adopt. And so I will forward this email I got to uh, 
to you all and we can maybe talk about it because apparently we do have the ability to uh, to not require a petition to uh, have one of those uh, requests be on the ballot. And I know from my own history that there, in the early days of the housing trust fund, there were some years where the uh, council agreed at our, at our request to put the uh, appropriation request on the ballot without forcing us to go through the petition process after we gone through a couple of, se of seasons of showing that there was sufficient uh, support to do that. So I'll send that, that out and uh, maybe we can have another discussion about it. Well, please send me a copy too, because when I asked him about this very thing, I was met with silence. And at least one other clerk I talked to about it was too. So, you know, sometimes we have a hard time communicating as well as we should with the Secretary of State. <laughs> I'll, I'll get that out probably tonight or tomorrow. Great. All right, uh, Bill. Sure. So uh, while we're on that topic, you know, just talking about petitions, I, I would note that there's there are two different thresholds. The city council can always put an item on the ballot and has done so at request of groups in the past. It was the housing trust fund. I think one of the more common practices in prior years was if somebody had been on, had petitioned to be on the ballot, had received approval of the voters, then the council might say, okay, you don't need to petition again, you know, as long as it's for the same amount. One question I think to consider for the council, and I don't need to answer it now, but just as we have this conversation going forward is, if we're gonna say, okay, you know, it's a bad year to petition, are we just gonna take every request to put it on? Um, because if we're not, then people still have to make the, you know, whereas if we receive a petition and it's legal, we have to put it on, we don't have the discussion to say, we're not gonna put it before the voters. So, you know, if, if I'm an agency and I want money, am I gonna take my chances that the council might say, sorry, we're not putting it on. So I just, we, we, on the other hand, if the council says, we'll put it on for all askers, we may, we may get groups that we've never heard from before that want money and suddenly they're gonna get on the ballot. So I think it's an, an important distinction. Um, so I, I hope there is some solution. I'll add that I heard the Secretary of State on uh, WDEV the other morning or noon or whatever morning, I guess, talking. And he was talking about potential all male ballots for town meeting. So I don't know whether they're trying to come up with funding for this or not, but uh, he was talking about the success of the mail in ballots now. And, you know, they were looking to see if they could replicate. So the, it's frustrating that they, they communicate with you guys better than me because well, I they would this was a, that, this that was, it wouldn't be available and that I should go on and look for my grants. So this was this was Secretary Commando was talking on WDEV to listeners. He wasn't communicating with me. He was talking yeah. to anybody who was listening. Well, yeah, I heard he it too. talks to anybody who's listening more than he talks to me. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, and, you know. Just means we'll be manufacturing those yes votes in the back room to put them on. Um, more to the point, we've got a couple of minor things here. Um, the CIP committee, uh, we're hoping to have them meet. I, I'm trying to remember who it is. It's three of you, and I forgot to double check it before, but you know who you are, right? The three members of the Capital Improvements Plan Committee. We are hoping we could meet um, on December 2nd and December 9 before those two council meetings, 515, 530, but we'll send out a reminder tomorrow uh, checking if that makes work. Um, if not, we'd like, you know, we'd like to have a couple meetings in the next couple weeks to look at what's left of the capital plan. Um, with regard to budget, we are having what we call our budget Congress starting tomorrow. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Our goal is to get you a draft budget for or a, a proposed budget for December 2nd. Um, so we're about a week early this year. Um, so it gives us more time to wring our hands. Finally, um, with, you know, as, as uh, we, the city clerk has mentioned a few times, uh, chasing people down to sign things. And also um, now with the police station being closed, our finance department has looked into electronic signatures. 
and we think that is going to be possible. Um, so more to come on that, but we will probably be buying at least three licenses, one for the clerk. John, you don't know this because you weren't here, but for liquor licenses and things, assuming those can be signed electronically. One for Serena to use for warrant stuff and one for Kelly for a sort of emergency warrants. So there'd be three people that would have access could send out with the list of names and all you have to do is click your electronic signature. So that would take care of those things. So, and it's secure, there's a whole, so we're, we're and the licenses aren't very expensive. They're like $20 a month per license. So $120 a year. So $360 a year total for three licenses. So um, anyway, more to come, details to be determined, but Kelly wanted me to let you know that. Otherwise, Happy Thanksgiving also to everyone, and, and uh, I hope none of you are traveling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. Uh, anyway, all right, well, thank you, everybody, and uh, have an excellent evening. Have a good Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll, we'll see you later on. Uh, so uh, without objection, we'll call this meeting adjourned. Great. See you all later. See you later. Good everyone, y'all. Thank you.